here. Um, but welcome everybody. And I would like to do a quick roll call here of transportation commissioners. Uh, me, Chair Julie Lead, um, Council Member Commissioner Kuhn. Present. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Spice. Not here, perhaps arriving later. Commissioner Morley. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Kraft. Here. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Parks. We don't know. All right, we do have a quorum. This meeting is being recorded, so everybody knows. And I would also like to welcome, we have, um, we have a great group this afternoon. I'm excited about the presentation and conversation we're going to have. We have members of the pedestrian advisory committee, the bicycle advisory committee here. And I know those committees had planned to have a joint meeting this afternoon and um, we were able to integrate their meeting into what we're talking about today. So welcome to both of those committee members. We have members from the Sustainability Commission here with us. Um, I believe we may have members from the Commission on Inclusion and Adaptive Living with us. Um, and then I noticed we have a few council members with us. So I'd like to welcome Council Member McCarthy. <laughs> council Member Sweet. Hello. <laughs> and I think I saw you were on Council Member Sweet. Oh. Okay. All right. Um, I see Council Member Shimoni. Welcome. And I believe I saw Vice Mayor Daggett. Hello, right? Well, welcome to you all. With that, I would like to move into our first item on the agenda, and that is public comment. So at this time, I invite any member of the public to address the commission on, on the subject with this, that is within our jurisdiction, and that is not on the meeting agenda, so that is not related to the Lone Tree Overpass. The Arizona Open Meeting Law prohibits us from discussing or taking action on an item that is not listed on the prepared agenda. However, we can respond to criticism um, made by those addressing us, ask staff to review a matter, or ask that a matter be placed on a future agenda. Are there any members of the public that would like to address the commission now? All right. Hearing none, um, then we will move forward. Um, and I would like to also note that we've got members of uh, Metro Plan here with us as well. Um, I believe we may have uh, members from Flag Biking Organization, perhaps some other organizations. So when we get to the public comment portion of this agenda item, um, I look forward to hearing from you. All right. We do not have approval of minutes from our last meeting. Um, I do note that all of our meetings are recorded and those recordings are posted online. So for future reference for those who are here. Moving on to new business. This is the Lone Tree Overpass project update and presentation. Um, so a couple of just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, the first one is um, I am co-owner of a local engineering firm and we do have work involved with the Lone Tree Overpass project and that work involves relocation, design of relocation of water and sewer mains to support the project, um, whatever the final project may look like. So I do have an interest in the Lone Tree Overpass project um, in addition to being a transportation commissioner. All right, as far as um, the presentation, what I would like to do is get through the presentation. If you have a burning question, commissioners that just can't wait, please put a Q or a C into the chat. Um, as far as how the chat works, once we get to discussion, that's really just to let me know that you have something that you want to say. And when we get to that discussion portion after the presentation, I'll kind of outline how I'd like to walk through and give everybody an opportunity to, to participate in the discussion and kind of frame that and have some structure to how we discuss it. Um, so as far as the presentation is concerned, if you could just take notes with your comments and questions as the team moves forward that through that presentation um, each one of the slides is numbered 
Um, and Christine and Jeff are going to help me monitor the hand raise functions. Um, it is a complete accident if I miss somebody, so please call it to my attention if for some reason I, I didn't call on you and you should have been called on. That's um, a complete oversight on my part. It's just hard with a lot of people on the team's call. Um, so with that, I am excited to introduce um, the city staff, Christine Cameron, the project manager from Capital Improvements to open it up on Lone Tree. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and Traffic Commission and everyone else in the room. Uh, thanks for your time today. I am Christine Cameron. I'm a project manager with City Capital Improvements. Uh, so we last presented to the commission in early August uh, to review the preliminary design for the Lone Tree Overpass. And from comments we received here and from council and from the public this past fall, we've worked to come to develop intersection alternatives for the project. And that's what you'll be seeing today with the first example being at Butler and Lone Tree. In addition, we've included a, a discussion on how a carbon neutrality concepts EMT, and induced demand were evaluated for the project. So the phase we are in for full design right now, uh, it takes the established concept plans that were approved for the Lone Tree Corridor and the Lone Tree Overpass and completes them for construction, which is anticipated to start in 2023. Benefits of the improvements include providing another north-south corridor in town in addition to Milton, and the overpass also improves circulation and safety of our road network uh, by providing a great separated crossing of the BNSF corridor and the future Rio de Flag. The established arterial use and future growth for Lone Tree has been included in our city planning efforts for several decades at least, uh, as defined in our regional plan. It's been integrated into area specific plans, into the Southside Community Plan, um, supported by council. And in, tw in 2018, it was put to the voters and approved for funding in Propositions 420 and 419. Lone Tree is an arterial roadway. So it's designed to carry vehicular and bike ped traffic through our community and keep car traffic off of our smaller local neighborhood streets. Uh, from the original project concepts, we have worked toward integrating the newer active um, transportation uh, master plan elements, including protected intersections and separated bike and pedestrian facilities, uh, including a foots along the route. This design of complete roadway in regard to bike and pedestrian facilities is the first our community has, has ever seen, so we're really proud of that. Uh, we do know Flagstaff is growing. We also know that we will not solve congestion fully. Um, improving traffic operations, bike and ped mobility, and carbon neutrality is an exercise in trade-offs and balance as the city continues uh, to reprioritize re goals and establishes what our procedures are to deliver them, um, which is very important, which we don't really have in hand right now. Uh, so with your help, uh, that's what we are working toward. Uh, we are looking today for uh, focused and specific comments on what you see, constructive discussion. Uh, we will be taking the feedback to council later this month on January 25th for a presentation. Uh, this recording will be placed on our Lone Tree Overpass website and sent to council to help them with their discussion later this month. Uh, the city has also um, has a presentation on transformative transportation on January 18th coming up at council. So there is a lot of great conversations happening here and, and we look forward to tonight. Um, I'll hand it over to Jason Karloftis. He is with the engineering group uh, WSP is our uh, main design consultant. He's a structural engineer and project design lead, and, and with him tonight, he has Joe Vaskovic, uh, Scott Beck, and Frank Fry, which are his traffic and roadway leads, and uh, also Chris Kane, who is with Ames Construction, uh, who will be building the project. So with that, I will hand it off to, to Jason Karloftis. So thank you very much. Thank you, and welcome WSP team. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Christine, for the introduction. Go ahead and share my screen hopefully everyone can see that um, do appreciate everyone's time and <clears throat> joining us this evening we are excited to be presenting this as christine mentioned we were asked uh from feedback from this group and from mayor and council and our, our public meeting in the fall of last year to reevaluate some sustainability goals and some intersection um, decisions at lone tree and butler specifically um, so we spent the last two months doing that and we're excited to be here on this evening to present these findings to you guys or to everyone who's attending tonight. Um, brief agenda, 
I'm gonna briefly go over some project updates, just sort of catch everyone up what we've done since the last meeting with this group. Um, then we're gonna focus on some of the sustainability goals and how we integrate those goals into this project. And then we'll talk about some of the intersectional refinements we were asked to go look at, again, focusing on Lone Tree and Butler with the acknowledgement that the similar concepts can be applied at the Lone Tree and Route 66 intersections. Project updates. Um, since our last meeting, we have met with the Beautification Arts and Sciences Commission. We had a meeting back in December 9th. We also have some planned outreach for a community forum to seek input on the aesthetics and the, the artist's involvement in, in this project um, coming up fairly soon. Um, we're working on that as we speak. So that'll be coming out um, shortly and, and some outreach will be coming out shortly. Um, we've also met with the pedestrian and bicycle advisory committees. This came through the city's involvement um, with Jeff Bauman, who discussed uh, with these groups the project's use of channelized right turn lanes and the permissive controlled rights at these intersections. We'll discuss these concepts later on as well. Um, we've had additional coordination meetings with both BNSF and the Army Corps of Engineers regarding the flood control project. Um, we had a meeting held with the Arm with uh, these groups on December 8th to go over the project and a status meeting. Um, this project is closely linked with their Rio de Flag flood control project. Um, both projects are working hand in hand with BNSF to get our construction maintenance agreements, which are required to get these projects under construction. And then we're having additional outreach through through meetings like this. Today's meeting is with the Transportation um, Commission and the, the supporting groups that are attending tonight. Um, we also had a meeting with sustainability back on December 8th as well, um, where we talked about the carbon neutrality plan, the city's new goals of zero vehicle miles traveled on projects and how this um, project that was planned before these goals could integrate these goals into the project moving forward. Um, so discussing sustainability, um, we really wanted to focus on this first to sort of set the stage of, of some of the decisions we set at the intersection. Um, so to talk about sustainability, we're really going to focus first on vehicle miles traveled, help define that, define how we model that with our work, try to explain that as best as we can. I'm going to try to use as much plain language as possible. If I do slip into some technical jargon, I do apologize. I'm going to try to define the terms we use as best as possible, but hopefully um, I, I catch myself and explain it as clearly as possible. Um, we're going to talk generally about approach to how VMT is integrated into public works and how other agencies and um, public works departments are handling this, this tricky issue. And then how we've incorporated this concept and the carbon neutrality plan goals into this project at a project specific level. Um, so we do recognize the city of Flagstaff has goals to not increase vehicle miles traveled from 2019 levels. Um, so first off, what is vehicle miles traveled? Um, the way that's defined on these projects is it's the average daily traffic, so the number of vehicles going through a network area in a given day times the distance each individual car is traveling on each trip. So it's just a math equation of total vehicles times the distance they've traveled for all the trips in one day. So that's what we're talking about when we're saying vehicle miles traveled. Um, we'll have some numbers for this specific network later on. Um, and VMT is measured and analyzed. You can hear me use VMT, that's the abbreviation um, I'll be stating throughout most of this presentation. Uh, but it's measured and analyzed using regional network traffic models. Um, the way these models work is they model a defined <clears throat> network of roadways and paths for this project. You know, we're using Metro Plan's regional model. Um, this is the model developed before um, this current update to their model. So this is uh, the model built for Blueprint 2040, we have modified it some for this project, and I'll get into that. Um, but these networks are built on assessing roadway links within the project corridors that match the roadway network of the city itself. Um, it includes inputs that define capacity for the roadways. So is it a two lane roadway? Is it a four lane roadway? It can adjust for population controls, number of drivers. What are your trip centers? Um, for an area for a city. Um, what is the population type? So that whether you have a student heavy population or an elderly population or a working age population that can define the number of vehicles per anticipated um, population center. And um, those are the main inputs. This is really a macro evaluation. So it's looking at a, a global large, you know, very zoomed back 
look at the uh, the city network as a whole. Um, we are going to be looking at intersections level. I do want to note that intersection type is generally not an input into these large models. Intersections push through the volume of traffic for ADT, but don't greatly affect in these network models um, where vehicles end up going through. is It's not one of the inputs these models would get um, pretty large and probably take quite a bit more analysis to run if we, we input all the intersection types at all these levels. So generally, VMT is not impacted by the intersection types in these networks. Um, so regional tools for this project that we're able to use, again, I mentioned Metro Plan's regional model. We did use the model that's, that's been built previously um, for this project. It's what the 2006 and 2010 studies were built on. Um, we are aware that there's a model update being rebranded as Onward. It's not yet available to the project team when we did our traffic impact analysis, and that's a report required for this project for the, analyzing how this project's gonna impact uh, the, the roadway network and intersections, adjacent intersections, um, items like that. Um, we did look at three, or actually five different scenarios. We looked at a 2019 no build scenario, and I have listed here, um, basically to give you a sense of scale is the number of dwelling units assumed in the network we modeled and the amount of commercial space in thousand square feet. Then we looked at a 2026 build and no build scenario. So when we say build, that means it includes the Lone Tree Overpass. And when we say no build, it means it's not in the network. So that that link is not put into the network. And that just lets us compare the same network with and without the roadway. <clears throat> um, you can see between 2019 and 2026, we are assuming uh, about a 0.7% per year growth in the Flagstaff area of dwelling units and commercial space. And then we also have a 2040 build and no build scenario. This is based on a traditional approach to traffic impact analyses where we do usually take it out, you know, 20 years in the future so we can try to analyze what future growth may impact on our designs. Um, going from 26 to 2040, it's about a 1.3% growth per year is how we get to these numbers. So when we go in later and you see changes on the average daily traffic, the ADT, if you hear me slip into that. Um, it's really being driven by this growth in population and growth in commercial centers for the city. Those are the main drivers for the growth in vehicles on the network. Um, so for this project, we took Metro Plan's model and we did provide some updates to the model for use in our traffic impact analysis. Um, we did incorporate some land use changes, uh, the hospital relocation, we identified some zoning changes that we were aware of um, that would shift some commercial centers. As I mentioned, that's one of the inputs. And how that impacts the network is if you have a change in a commercial center, it changes where your trip destination is. So if you're at your house and you used to go to one shopping center, but now a new shopping center opens up closer to you, that may be your new trip destination. So that's how it impacts DMT for these models. Um, we incorporated identified public works projects in the 2040 model. Um, so 2026 doesn't have any unbuilt projects besides the Lone Tree, but the 2040 model does if it's been identified and funded by the Flagstaff's Public Works Program. So this does not include the Lone Tree I-40 interchange in the model. I know that question's come up. Um, that is not a funded project, so that is not included in our 2040 model. And then we also did evaluate a two lane and four lane Lone Tree overpass scenario to evaluate the impact on greenhouse gases. Um, if we go from a four lane, which is what's in our current um, identified project as a, as a major arterial for the city and looked at it as a two lane scenario instead. Um, this is the only change to this model that really would have impacted VMT because um, it does change the capacity of the roadway. Uh, compare, but it's it was just an adjustment of one link in the model. Overall, we didn't see a large change in VMT, and and we'll we'll talk about this a little bit down here. Um, but we did look at that just to see what the impacts were for greenhouse gases in recognition of what the carbon neutrality goals for the city were. So regional VMT results. These are given as an amount per day. Just want to make that clear. So um, based on the 2019 model, we have about 2.5 million vehicle miles traveled per day in the network. 
Our 2026 no build and build models both project about a 2.6 million. Um, one thing I do want to point out is between the no build and the build, there is a fairly small change between vehicle miles traveled. Um, this may seem counterintuitive, and we will talk about induced demand a little later on. We're adding roadway. So there is a gut feeling that this is going to increase the number of vehicles on the roadway. This roadway is really located, you know, next to downtown. It's a, it's a network road. Um, and so what our models were showing was that it's really just changing the flow of traffic through this area. There was no real driver of it pulling new traffic to this area uh, of the network. Um, so that is a small, small change. And same with the 2040. Again, there's a, there is a difference between build and no build, but overall it's small. The big drivers between 2019 and 2026 and 2026 and 2040 is again that population growth and that commercial growth estimated for the city. Um, so going back to induced demand, I know this came up the last time we spoke with mayor and council. <clears throat> um, so what is induced demand? There's Induced demand is the concept that if you build a roadway, you're going to encourage more vehicle trips on the network um, because there's more capacity on the roadway. So if there's more capacity, there's more encouragement to drive to use your automobile to get from destination A to destination B. Um, there's really three drivers for induced demand. One is sort of, you can think of it as an exurb component. If you have a major arterial or a loop road or a, a major roadway connecting a city center to a, a neighborhood community, you know, you might encourage some some movement out to the exurbs. And so people are moving out of the downtown centers or high density areas. And now they're driving into a city center or a commercial center to get to work. And so instead of living near where they work, they're now living away from where they work. And so their trip distance goes up. So when you increase that trip distance, your VMT goes up. Um, there's a second component that um, better capacity leads to extra trips. So if you're sitting at home, three or four p.m. comes around, you know you're about to hit rush hour traffic, but you need to go pick something up at the store. You may be discouraged because you know you're going to be you're sitting in gridlock. Um, so you may plan all your trips that you need to make that day for a, a one, you know, one time of the day after rush hour is done. If you have improved capacity you know, you're able to get to your destination easier, you might split those trips up into two trips. It's easier to get to your destination, get home, and then go back out later for your second trip. So that's another component that can push induced demand. Um, the third is if you have a major corridor improvement and you're drawing vehicles from one source of congestion to another, but it's in such a way that vehicles are driving a longer distance to get there. Um, Good example might be like Phoenix with their loop road systems. You might go out of your way to use a loop road system, even if it takes you more miles to get to your destination, it might be a faster way to get to your destination. So those are sort of the three components that can go into induced demand components. For this particular roadway, <clears throat> being in the location where it's at, um, you know, we're between Ponderosa, 4th Street, and Milton along Butler, we're seeing really that second category where most of our induced demand is going to come from that better capacity. If we improve capacity, you might be encouraging more trips um, throughout the day. You are getting some of that third component with rerouting. The distance for rerouting from Milton to Lone Tree or Lone Tree to Forest Street or Ponderosa, it's not a large distance. So that's where we anticipate most of our induced demand coming from. Um, one ca So we, we looked around trying to find out how do we best estimate this for, for this particular project. Um, the best calculator we could find, the one that was most applicable to this project, is from RMI. This is a, a group out of Denver, Colorado, that studies this, this induced demand effect. They have a shift calculator. It's online. Um, if, if you Google RMI shift calculator, it's pulled up and you can use it. It's pretty simple to use, pretty intuitive to use. Um, but this calculator uses demographics and density characteristics of a, a county. Uh, to to predict what the induced demand for increased lane miles would be. So we're doing a widening project south from Sawmill to Butler, and we're doing a new roadway project from Butler up to Route 66. We're adding about two lane miles overall. Um, we're four new lanes north and two new lanes south. So it's just about two miles. Um, using this calculator, 
um, based on the demographics of Coconino County, which is as uh, fine grained as it gets on this calculator. Um, it is project projecting that we're gonna have about 2 million extra vehicle miles, but that's per year. And then it also gives the greenhouse gas emission estimate again per year. Um, what this projects out to is on the conservative side, about 5,500 vehicle miles traveled per day. So going back to the previous slide, we're at 2.6 million vehicle miles traveled per day. We're increasing it, you know, around 6,000. So based on this shift calculator, which is the best available tool we have, I do understand City of Flagstaff's looking into developing their own calculator, not available yet. Um, but based on this, it's about a 0 0.2, 0 0.3% increase in the network modeled. So even if we do, using this data, it's a, it's a pretty small increase overall, the induced demand effects of this project and the, the Flagstaff network we modeled. It's also less than if we go back to the 2019 being the goal, we projected a 2% increase. This 0.2% uh, increase is less than we projected for our analysis for our opening year. So um, we haven't directly added this into our network model, this induced demand, but by assuming our population growth and commercial growth that we did, um, we feel we're on the conservative side of the induced demand impacts, and that's based on this data from RMI. Um, so next, we want to talk about how VMT can be incorporated into public works. This is really where this project becomes a little bit tricky for us. Um, we've talked a lot with our counterparts in other districts who are dealing with the same complica complicated issues that Flagstaff's dealing with right now. How do we achieve our carbon neutrality goals? How do we achieve similar VMT goals in a public works program? We have a project that expands roadway capacity, but we have a goal that says zero increase in VMT. Um, at, the, at the project level, at the micro level, there's very little we can do to impact VMT directly. So we went out and we asked of our counterparts, especially in California and Caltrans, how they're doing it. Um, from what our feedback we got is typically VMT is a planning level decision. And what I mean is VMT is evaluated when these projects are built into the planning stage and funding stage of, of city projects. So they'll identify, hey, we want to build Lone Tree. We want to build this other arterial road. We want to do these improvements over here. We can predict that VMT based on induced demand and our model networks will go up by two, three percent. So then you start looking at that increase on a policy level and you start looking for offsets elsewhere to, to start reducing them. Because offsets can't necessarily come with the roadways, but they can come with other policy decisions. So how some of these public, public works agencies are offsetting VMT growth is balancing it with offsets like roadway lane reductions on other streets, increasing public transportation to reduce the need for, for vehicles on the roadway. So it's reducing the ADT component, the average daily traffic component of VMT, improving carpool and ride share, again, reducing the ADT side of the equation because you were increasing the vehicle miles traveled potentially with increased capacity and then increasing bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, again, reducing vehicle trips. So these are all ADT targeted solutions to offsetting the VMT goals with roadway projects. Um, so again, at a project level, it's, it's difficult to reduce VMT. Um, we can still evaluate though, the greenhouse gas impacts at the intersection and at the network level. Um, so both at the macro and micro level, when I talk macro, it's gonna be the network level, the traffic modeling level. When I talk micro, it's going to be at the intersection specific level. So it's just how refined and how discrete our viewpoint is when we're looking at the bigger picture of the project. Um, and we do know greenhouse gas is a secondary component of the city's car. Well, it's the primary component, but it's another way to look at the city's carbon neutrality plan outside of VMT. So while we can't directly address VMT on our project level, we can look at what the greenhouse gas impacts and make design decisions that affect greenhouse gas impacts from project decisions. Um, this is a slide that we have borrowed from Metro Plan. Um, this shows approaches to through transportation demand management, and that's the method of how we reduce VMT um, by, by doing these offsets. Um, so I've, I've highlighted some project specific reductions we're doing. Um, we're providing pedestrian and bike facilities through the foots trail and through the, the sidewalk connectivity, the pedestrian and bicycle focused intersections. 
Um, so these are some just projected intersections on a general level. These are not project specific um, reductions. So this is just sort of a, a, at a global level, if you look at the chart. Um, we also have street connectivity. So this may be a little bit counterintuitive, but how does street connectivity, how does placing a new street reduce VMT? Um, this this comes out if you have severe congestion, drivers start looking for alternate trips, and alternate paths to get from point A to point B. So if you have congestion in the network we're looking at in the downtown adjacent area, Milton, Lone Tree, Ponderosa, do vehicles start avoiding this area? Do they go over to 4th Street? Do they go over to I-40? Um, again, is are you going to another higher capacity roadway or another grade separated crossing with BNSF to avoid some of the congestion issues in this area? Um, if you are, your VMT, your miles traveled, may be going up just to avoid the congestion area. So providing street connectivity, like what we're doing here, providing a new grade crossing, grade separated crossing with BNSF, you're improving the network connections and you're letting people take a more natural path through this area. So a little counterintuitive, but we do have a little bit of that with this project, because again, what's the goal of this project is to improve operations of this particular network within the city. Um, third or fourth bullet is corridor changes elsewhere. Um, do we have a option to maybe do some lane reductions or other modifications to the street network elsewhere as a response to this project? Um, this is not a project decision. Again, this is a policy decision. I just want to state that up front. Um, but looking at our network, so what you're seeing here is this is average daily traffic. The red is if it was no project was built, and black is if the project's built. Um, so you can see here's Lone Tree itself. The no build has no traffic, and once you build it, and these are 2026 numbers, we're projecting about 38,000 vehicles per day will use this uh, connection. So you ask yourself, where are these vehicles coming from? They're coming from mainly Milton and Route 66, uh, but a lot of them are coming from San Francisco and Beaver. These are at grade crossings with BNSF. They get stopped when trains come through. And now we're providing an arterial roadway, arterial roadway with a grade separation. So you're not gonna be stopped by trains anymore. So it's a big draw for users who are starting on the south or north side and want to cross this sort of natural north-south dividing line where BNSF runs through town. Um, you go on to 2040, we see the same thing even with additional population growth, we still see the same sort of reduction. So what does this tell us is, hey, there's a large reduction on these two streets that are more, you know, more local oriented streets anyways. Is there a potential for city to reevaluate how these streets are being used? Is there a potential for lane reduction or re-identifying in those bike corridors or pedestrian corridors and reducing capacity on these streets to offset some of the VMT growth that comes from the Lone Tree overpass? So again, this is outside the project level. This is more of a policy decision. But these are ways that the city at a policy level can start trying to evaluate BMT and the trade-offs that come with it with, a, with every new roadway project. I'm looking specifically at greenhouse gas emissions. This was presented previously at mayor and council. It's a little bit modified, um, but we did compare a two-lane Lone Tree overpass and a four-lane tree overpass. These are the same numbers we presented previously looking at just the 2026 year um, focused on if the city achieves their goals for zero VMT growth and carbon neutrality, that there won't be as, you know, vehicle growth isn't going to reach the 2040 levels. Um, we did add columns that go back to the RMI calculator, it had increased carbon emissions due to induced demand. So we did add that impact to our values. And what we're showing is that fuel consumption and emissions based on volume congestion do go down. And again, it's a little bit counterintuitive. How does adding a roadway reduce the gallons of fuel used? This mainly comes from um, two items. Vehicles generally operate more efficiently at certain speeds than others. So at low speeds, the uh, carbon engine operates fairly inefficiently. So zero to 15, zero to 20 miles per hour. It's a pretty inefficient mode of travel. 20 to 35, it, it, it gets better. I think it peaks right around 40 for most vehicles and it does vary by vehicle type, vehicle weight, 
um, and then again tapers off the faster you go. So as we're improving the network movement and flows, we're getting increases in speed. And I'm not talking about going up to 55 or 60, but just more achievable, 15 to 20, 17 to 25. Um, so we have more efficient use of fuel by, by vehicles. We also have a new grade separated interchange with BNSF. So we're not sitting idling at the train tracks waiting for the 80 to 100 trains that come a day from BNSF. Uh, while well, while well, cars back up and idle and just sit there burning carbon emissions waiting for the train to pass. We also have a new arterial corridor which improves intersection movements in general throughout the network so there's less delay at intersections throughout the network and so there's less idling at intersections. So all of these together add up to these estimates that we came up with um, using network data again based on metro plans models and then data from fuel efficiency standards um, speed standards and and how does uh, engine efficiency rate to speed and then delay time data that we can get from our models those are all built into these numbers and then we reduced it for the induced demand so if we do have the additional vehicles and we have the greenhouse gas impacts that rmi provides what we end up is the four lane lone tree overpass <clears throat> because of the enhanced mobility is providing to the network does have a higher impact, but the two lane um, option also has an impact with almost 43,000 gallons for two lanes and 206,000 gallons per year for the four lane. And that comes out to tons of emissions below. So even though this project doesn't necessarily meet the zero VMT, this is just a way we can show that it's still meeting the carbon neutrality plan for the city uh, by projected greenhouse gas emissions being reduced. Um, so some takeaways are that the 2026 vehicle miles travel is approximately the same as the 2019. It's a 2% change overall. Um, of this, about 0.2% could be assumed to be induced demand. Um, so it's a small, induced demand is a small impact overall. Most of the anticipated growth we're stating is, is normal population growth and business growth about 0.7% per year. Um, we did not update the 2019 numbers of the actual growth data. That's just an assumption from 2019 to 2026. Um, also from this model, the comparisons between build and no build, there was no significant impact in the models. Um, it was less than a tenth of a percent change between the build and no build options. Um, we've also identified that there are some offsets in the project that we've identified, but then integrating those impacts into the VMT estimates and impacts is very difficult. How much does establishing a north-south foots trail connection um, reduce vehicle drivers in the area? It's very hard for us to quantify that, so we haven't quantified that, but we do expect it to impact the number of drivers in the network. Um, similar to the network capacity that we have included a little bit, um, but generally the pedestrian bike facilities, those are we acknowledge they will help the, the VMT situation, but it's hard to quantify. And we also shown that the four lane and two lane scenarios do reduce, potentially reduce greenhouse gas emissions with the four lane um, option uh, having the highest reduction in greenhouse gases and meets the carbon neutrality plan of the city um, that way, even if we aren't meeting the zero VMT. Um, so that's a brief summary of what we've looked at with sustainability. Um, now we'd like to move into intersection refinement and analysis. Um, so when we met last time, we talked a lot about the decisions that went into intersections. We then presented several options for mayor and council. We were asked to go back and look at some additional analysis, some additional intersections at Lone Tree and Butler. Um, as a reminder, Route 66 is an ADOT facility, so anything we do up there will have some ADOT impacts and ADOT influence, but some of the decision making we're showing at Lone Tree and Butler may be applicable up at Route 66. So right now we're focused at Butler and Lone Tree with a caveat that if there are items that we can introduce into the Route 66 and Lone Tree intersection, we'll definitely consider it as the project moves forward. So I do want to point out why we're focused on Butler and Lone Tree. I um, want to walk you through the four intersections at a high level real quick, and then we'll dig into each one individually. So we have four. 
Um, first one is the traditional, and we were calling this traditional. If this was a standalone project and we weren't doing as much outreach as we were doing, this is most likely the intersection we would end up with based on just um, volume data going through the intersection, vehicular data, and then trying to provide um, levels of safety for pedestrians and cyclists as we're going through the intersections. Um, without any real enhancements for pedestrians and cyclists. So highlights for this is we got double left turn lanes on the north leg and on the east leg. So the southbound and the westbound directions. We don't have any channel channelized right turns. When I say channelized, it, it's going to mean a right turn lane that's separated from the through lanes by a, a right turn island. So that's what I mean by channelized. We have separated bike lanes on Lone Tree Road. Um, so you can see we have Foots Trail on the west side, and then we have a northbound bicycle lane on the east side as well. And then we have raised refuge islands on the south and west approaches. We do not have refuge islands on the north and east approaches um, due to space limitations. Full build out is what we're considering. If we had every pedestrian enhancement we can place into this intersection, um, this is what we're considering this intersection. So again, we have double lefts on the southbound and westbound approaches. We did add channelized right turn lanes on the northeast and southwest corners. We have separated bike lanes uh, north and south and east and west. Again, they're on the street along Butler for the traditional. And then we got raised mini islands again just in the west leg and the south leg. We had a request to look at an option for single left turn lanes. <clears throat> so this is very similar to the full build out, except that we are losing the second turn lane at the north leg and on the east leg. This uh, provides us the benefit of having raised refuge islands in all four legs. Um, generally, though, it's the same as um, the full build out otherwise. And then we have a, a balanced intersection type, and this one was our attempt to just look at if we take all the ideas from the full build out and the traditional and balance right away impacts and, and some other impacts, what will we come up with if we're trying to balance all the concepts and all the demands of the project? Um, we're also sort of showing impacts as we go further east just to show the right in right outs at Gable Street and Windsor Lane. This is fairly consistent on all four corners. The main difference being on single left, you have a raised median. On the other three options, you have a striped median that's not intended to cross um, to go westbound. So that's why it's right in, right out. Um, Lumber Street does have currently based on queue lengths. And again, I do want to stress where it's schematic level or preliminary design. So we haven't done final design, but right now the concept would allow a, a eastbound uh, left out of Lumber Street. Um, so now going into each intersection a little bit more closely. Um, so traditional intersection, again, this is if we were just doing our standard practice, historical practice, um, we don't have any <laughs> channelized rights. We do still have the protected bicycle movements uh, north and south. And you can see here we've added distances from curb to curb for the crossing distances. It's just to provide everyone a idea of how far it would cross, it would take to cross for a pedestrian or cyclist using the crosswalks. The time here is for a pedestrian crossing that intersection. Jason, it's pretty small on my screen. Would you mind reading those for the group? In case anyone yeah. has a small screen too. Of course, Madam Chair. Um, so West Leg, we have an 88 foot distance. Um, south leg, a 90 foot distance. East leg, we have a 91 foot distance. And then the north leg, we have a 91 foot distance. And the times all vary between 25.2 seconds and 26 seconds. So not a significant uh, distance or change in distance or length for the traditional. Did fully render this to sort of give an idea of what it would actually look like in practice. Um, you can see the buildings that are out here. This is Lone Tree to the north. So this is a new uh, overpass. We do have the uh, double lefts coming southbound and westbound, the raised medians, the protected cyclist crossings, and then the at street crossings on Butler. So those are really the highlights of this concept. I got to catch up on my notes, apologize. Um, looking more specifically at the approaches, so the west leg, and again, I have this map here to orient yourself. So it's the eastbound approach or the west leg. 
Um, you can see we have a right, two throughs, and a left, and then we got two throughs in the opposite direction. And then on the eastbound direction, this is our largest crossing. We have a dedicated right, two throughs, two lefts, and then two throughs coming from the opposite direction. So we have a walking speed and a riding speed. These are based on uh, published data. We could find the 2.4 miles per hour is from the manual uniform traffic control devices. Um, so that's where we get that from. That's a published federal guideline. Um, but the east leg is our controlling leg. It's a distance of 91 feet. It would take a pedestrian based on this walking speed or approximately 26 seconds to cross a cyclist um, riding you know, at an average pace, about five seconds to cross. Again, we only have Refuge Island on the eastbound approach, and this is a protected cycling crossing. Um, looking at the other two directions, north and south, so facing north, looking at the southbound. Again, we have a dedicated right, two through lanes, two left turn lanes, and then two opposing movement through lanes. Facing south for the northbound direction, we have a dedicated right, two through lanes, northbound left, and then two opposing through movements. Uh, the north crossing distance is approximately the same as the east at 91 feet. And then the south leg, we did not assume any pedestrians stopping in the refuge island, but this is wide enough for re refuge if they can't cross in time, but we did not assume that for, for the, these numbers. The crossing time is about 26 seconds again for, for someone crossing. Um, so for these design features, the longest distance is 91 feet. The longest crossing time is 26 seconds. The longest bicycle crossing time is five seconds. And uh, we did add the available green time. So what's the shortest available green time for through movements that these pedestrians would be making this crossing is 33.7 seconds based on our modeling. So there is available green time for pedestrians to make this movement. If they're standing on the curb, they get the signal to cross, they would have time to cross the intersection in, in one green, one, in the available green time for the corresponding through movement. Again, these crossing times are based on the MUTCD. And it assumes the complete crossing during one single green phase. And this is for a wheelchair speed of 3.5 feet per second or 2.4 miles per hour. So we did convert it. Um, this is also from backed up by FHWA, Federal Highway Administration's university course on bicycle and pedestrian transportation, just as additional backup. We wanted to verify the MUTCD assumptions. Um, I do have a 360 exhibit that I'll pan slowly, but if you're looking forth, uh, north on this intersection, I'll go uh, northeast, southwest. You can sort of see how the intersection is behaving, just to give everyone sort of a, a view, viewpoint. You got a standard corner coming across, you got your protected bike lane coming through. You can sort of see how the signalized poles would look approximately. Again, standard corners. We have ADA elements at the corners. Uh, this would be bikes are again crossing along at Butler on the, in the roadway. So this is not a shared crosswalk. And this is now facing south and then coming back around to the west. We have a protected bike lane and protected pedestrian crossing. And then we f finish up back north and you can see the foots trail connection on the west side and the dedicated northbound bicycle line a lane on the east side. So that's sort of a 360 view of the intersection coming through. So those are pedestrian and bicycle impacts. Um, looking at vehicular impacts. We did look at 2026 and 2040 model. We did use two programs to evaluate these numbers. Um, first is Synchro. This is a micro simulation model. Looks at just the intersection by itself to based on the volume of traffic going through in the peak hour. The We did look at AM afternoon and p.m. peak hours found generally the p.m. The, the rush hour traffic to get home was the controlling hour. So as we were doing this analysis, um, we didn't run these models for all three peak hours. We focused just on the p.m. peak hour. So you see just the p.m. peak hour data as part of this presentation. But for vehicles coming through this intersection in the 2026 year, 
the level of service, and that's just how we define the ability of vehicles to get through the intersection. Um, it's an engineering way to quickly identify how the intersection is op operating as a whole with regards to vehicle use. You get a level of service D in the 26 year and a level of service E in the PM peak. Um, F is the worst level condition. Um, so even in the 2040 year volumes, we're, we're still, it, it's not great, but it's, it's still a serviceable level of service. We have an average vehicle delay of 46.9 seconds. So again, if you think back to the available green times, 33 seconds, you're likely going to be stopped at least a cycle in the PM peak hour. Um, it, it's hard for us to really model and say how many green cycles you might be stuck or you may be stuck through one, two, or three intersections, inter, uh, light signals going through here, but you know, rough approximation, if you're waiting on average 46 seconds, you're probably getting through the second cycle. So you're probably going to wait one whole cycle, queue up, and then go through the second one. And then we'll have a map up shortly, but the longest queue length is about 600 feet. Total vehicle delay in hours, in the peak hour is uh, 58 hours for all vehicles going through the intersection. And then um, synchro. And then the other program I forgot to mention was sim traffic. This is a, uh, it's not a full macro level program like what we did for the VMT and uh, corridor analysis, but it does look at a higher level intersection or it looks at our intersection and several intersections in each direction and then seeds a network with vehicles. So you can see how your your intersection is impacting adjacent intersections and it uses delays and backups and traffic, you know, blocking if the left turn lane blocks the through movement of that intersection, you might reroute traffic. So it's a little bit more um, accurate of how real drivers behave than what Synchro would at a micro level. But it provides us this fuel used of about 57 gallons um, in the peak hour for all vehicles through the intersection. Um, and we just provide these just to give comparative values. And we'll summarize this at the end of this presentation. So um, please don't feel obligated to memorize these numbers. We'll, we'll summarize them at the end for everybody. Um, this is our Q diagram. So based on our SIM traffic analysis, as vehicles are running through this intersection in the peak hour on the 2026 year, how far is traffic backing up? So you can see the worst case is your western leg, the eastbound direction. You're backing up about 600 feet. So if you were trying to get to the intersection, you'd be backed up to O'Leary Street. Um, the other directions, you know, you're backing up to Windsor Street on the, the westbound direction and you're past Brennan on Lone Tree and then uh, northbound's not that bad. So that's just to give you an idea of what the cues are for, for as you're approaching the intersection. We also wanted to look at the footprint of this intersection compared to other large intersections in the Flagstaff area. So we use the Route 66 and 4th Street intersection as a comparative guide. So you're seeing an aerial shot of that intersection and then the brown lines you're seeing is the outline of our intersection. So what you can see from this is the west or the east leg, the westbound direction is, is comparable, but the other three corners are a little bit shorter. So it fits within this intersection. So it's, it's definitely not bigger, but it, it is smaller, but not greatly smaller than that. But there is this reduction in this intersection compared to other large intersections in the Flagstaff area. Um, there are also refuge islands on two legs. The wet, I do want to point out that the west side is the main projected usage because it's the foots trail connection. So we would expect most users that are trying to get north south to be on this west side of the roadway too. And that's where these refuge islands are lo located. If they're trying to get to this commercial center, they have an option to use the refuge islands going north south and then again east west to get to the commercial center. Um, so full build out. So this again is <clears throat> if we have every pedestrian improvement that we felt was viable for this intersection, what would it look like? Um, biggest changes are these channelized rights on the northeast and southwest corners. The big result of this is a pretty substantial reduction in width because you can have pedestrians and cyclists stage on these islands and when they're actually crossing the main roadway you're eliminating one of the lanes of traffic that they're having to cross. 
you're limiting the right turn lane in the east-west direction. Oh, so the traveling distances are 70 foot on the west leg, 83 foot on the south leg, 69 feet on the east leg, where we were at 91 feet um, previously, and then we still have 86 on the north leg, so that becomes our longest uh, movement here. We do have about a 20 foot crossing on the channelized um, right turn lane as well. And we'll talk more about this channelized right concept later on. Um, but generally, the crossing times are about uh, 20 seconds to 25 seconds. So again, a reduction from what we saw with the last intersection. Going through the rendering, very similar layout, but you have your channelized rights, north and south. You will notice that the building to make this achievable does have to get demoed on the northeast corner, whereas we avoid it on the traditional intersection. There's also impacts to the southwest um, property here. We are cutting off driveway access and may have to look at reevaluating parking, maybe coming off of Eldon to the west here, providing alternate access. We're also potentially impacting a new property that's not impacted by the traditional on this parcel here, potentially losing driveway. Um, this would have to be evaluated during a final design, whether or not a driveway and the bicycle um, pathway is currently um, shown is compatible. So those are some right away impacts that come with this concept. So facing west, <clears throat> you have your right turn channelized and your median island, which shortens the crossing. So you have two throughs a left and then the two opposing throughs. In the east, so the westbound direction, you have two throughs, two lefts, and then the two opposing movements. Again, no refuge island in the middle either. You do have protected cycling, cyclist crossings for both of these options. And your distances are about 70 feet or about 20 second walking time. Full build out north and south. Um, this time the channel eyes will be on your right for both conditions. But for the southbound direction facing north, you got a right turn lane, two throughs, two lefts, and then two opposing movements. And then the southbound, so northbound, south facing direction, you got a dedicated right, two throughs, a northbound left, and then two opposing through movements. So this is your longest crossing distance at 86 feet and 83 feet again we're assuming no stopping at this refuge island and a crossing time of 24.6 seconds um, so the available green time based on our model of intersection this will change for each intersection because uh, sim traffic does try to optimize intersection operations based on the intersection layouts it's a little bit different than the model i described for metro plan it will take into account the intersection layouts we do have available green time of 32.1 seconds versus a pedestrian crossing time of 26.4. So again, there's enough time for the best pedestrian to cross and the available green time of the opposing uh, or the corresponding through movement. Um, sharing the same 360 view. Um, this is the northbound view. So northeast corner, we have our refuge island channelized right. And then again, we take out this building. I'm coming back around on the east leg, so the westbound direction. There's no refuge island. We just got a double stripe, a more traditional corner, no impacts to these parcels. Then we have our uh, right and northbound movements looking south. Again, dedicated. And whenever you see the green crosswalk, it's going to be a dedicated bicyclist crossing, separating the pedestrians from the, the cyclists. Then we got our second refuge island or right turn bay island and our um, second channelized right. Um, again, this does carry back into this parking lot, not quite, quite models we would potentially impact access here and may have to give them alternate access back to Eldon back here. Continuing back around to the west, traditional corner on the northwest. But because we are keeping cyclists off of Butler and the way this is coming through, we do impact the driveway potentially on this parcel back here. So just some items to keep in mind. Uh, 
Um, so the full build out intersection for vehicle service. We have similar levels of service at D and E for the 2026 and 2040 PM peak. Average vehicle delays are very similar at 40, 48 seconds. Queuing is a little bit shorter, but fairly similar to the traditional. And the gallons used in the total vehicle delay at 2026 is very similar as well as traditional. So we're, we're providing pedestrian and bicycle improvements. Vehicle operations are basically behaving in a very similar manner. Um, the reason we're seeing this, it, you may intuitively think that we're having a lot better right turn operations, um, but we are treating this crossing as a signalized crossing. So it's not a continuous right turn on red, it's a right turn on green only. So this right turn movement is only allowed um, during approved movements. So we don't really gain much capacity by splintering them off. And again, we'll talk more about options that at that corner and using the channelized right later on. So here's the queue distances. Again, the eastbound controls. We're not quite to O'Leary Street. Still a little bit past Brennan. Um, not quite to Windsor and then north of Churchill. So very similar to what you saw with the traditional for this option. So this is again really just benefits for pedestrians and cyclists, shortening crossing times and providing these uh, refuge islands um, with the channelized rights. Um, and then here's a comparison of this intersection with 4th and 66. Again, focus on the crossing from island to curb. You can see it's significantly smaller overall than the Route 66 and 4th if you're looking at this four corner intersection. And that's what we're trying to emphasize with this with this graphic. So single left intersection, this is specific request from Mayor and Council and Sustainability um, to look at a single left option with the, the southbound left as a single left and the westbound the left as a single left. Um, this is otherwise very similar to the full build out option. All we are is taking away one of the left turn lanes, replacing it with a median. So now you have refuge islands on all four legs. That's the biggest change. Um, you also have a option to maybe shrink the size of the intersection some, but at Marin Council there was a expressed interest in having refuge islands for, for users. So this is the route we took at this stage. Again, we're at a conceptual stage on a final design stage. So these are things that could be worked out during final design um, for preferences. It does not impact the behavior much for pedestrians or for vehicles. Um, so this is the way we're showing it for now. Uh, the crossings are all similar to the full build out. There's no significant change because all we are is adding refuge islands. So we're still at a 25 second crossing with 86 foot uh, distance, the north leg being the controlling crossing. So there's the rendered view. Again, you, the, the main takeaway is the, the meeting islands on the north and east legs still have the same property impacts on the three corners. Um, and generally, this is otherwise very similar to the uh, full build op option besides that double left. Hey, Jason, before you move um, away mm -hmm. from particular graphic, um, that slide, just a couple of quick questions so it's clear for people before we move forward. First one is, um, is the intent to have a, a raised crosswalk for those um, right turns, that slip lane? Yeah, so we will. Um, it's well, it's not a slip lane. Um, this is a channelized right. Um, okay. So we will get into that a little bit later on. There are several options we can look at here. I know uh, Jeff presented this uh, to the bicycle and ped action committees. So we do have some slides later on. So if I can hold those questions so we get to those slides, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. And um, will that, that also... we have better graphics? OK, thank you. Yep, no problem. Good question. And we, we did yep. try to deal that deal with that. And then when you get to that point, too, there's also a question about um, how bikes approach that stop bar um, and at the green crossing. So when we get there, let's plan on addressing that question. Okay. As well. Yeah, Thank we you. do have um, some exhibits showing how bicyclists can get through some of these intersections. We'll bring those up as well. Appreciate that. Um, so crossings are very similar again. The, the big change being the 
the reduction in, in left turn lanes. So you're seeing channelized right, two through movements, a single left turn lane, and two opposing through movements. Um, coming westbound direction, this is where we have reduced from a, a double left to a single left. We have a channelized right, two through movements, single left, and two opposing through movements. Um, distances and walking times are very similar with the west leg being the longest at 70 feet and 20 seconds. In the north-south directions, southbound, again, the change was going from a double left in the southbound direction to a single left. So we have a dedicated right, two throughs, and a single southbound left, and then two opposing movements, uh, through movements. And then on south unchanged, we got a dedicated right, two throughs, a northbound left, and two opposing through movements. So North Lake still controls 86 seconds with a walking time of 24.6. Um, pedestrian crossing distance again is 86 feet. That's the controlling distance. We have an available agree time of 32.1 seconds with a crossing time of 24.6. So again, it's still enough green time to allow pedestrians to cross uh, uninterrupted without having to use the refuge islands. Looking at the 360 view, <clears throat> it's going to look very similar to what we just looked at. Wider median on the northbound leg. Again, final design decision is made. We could look at shrinking this some and reducing this 86 a little bit. We still have to keep some width here to consider this a refuge island. So we're not gaining all of this distance. We're only gaining a couple feet. If we do reduce the intersections, we also have to align the through movements with the opposite approach. So there's some we can do with this intersection median or this median width, but we are controlled by other elements. Um, coming around, we do have to demo this property, take some of this parcel. <clears throat> we have protected bicycle crossings at all four corners. And they'll just keep coming around. Traditional um, corner on the southwest or southeast. Again, a refuge island, channelized right on the southwest. We are still impacting with this concept, potentially this parking lot. We'd have to evaluate in final design and still impacting this parcels driveway, potentially that we have to evaluate in final design. And swinging back around back to the north. Um, where this does start to change compared to the double left is in vehicle. Um, Usage of the intersection, we do drop the 2026 from a level of service D to a level of service E. And in 2040, <clears throat> we drop from level of service E to a level of service F. Average vehicle delay, if you remember, was about 48 seconds. It increases to about 74 seconds. And the queue length goes from 530 feet roughly to almost 2,000 feet on um, the 2026 year. Vehicle delay goes, I believe we're at 55, and again, we'll summarize this at the end, up to 92 hours total for all vehicles. <clears throat> and emissions jumped, I believe it was around 55, 56, I actually have it in front of me. 58.2, full build out up to 91.8 gallons of the peak hour used. And again, this is mainly due to additional idling time through the intersection. Um, based on this delay, again, if you're looking at a 32 second 33 second green time. You may get through on the second cycle, but your borderline may be waiting two cycle, uh, two signal cycles to get through this intersection. So that's the impact to the average driver. So it may take you two, two or three cycles to get through this intersection. Again, that's very hard for us to determine um, the output we get is vehicle delay. It's really hard to correlate that directly with the number of cycles um, you're looking at, but just based on green time, it's borderline whether you're getting through the second or third signal. Looking at the queues, um, this is where the biggest impact is. <clears throat> you can see queues have backed up significantly. The biggest driver of this is because we can't get as many lefts through the intersection that we have to adjust our green times and left turn times <clears throat> at the intersection that we can't get as many vehicles through the intersection. We actually, in the peak hour, get 1,000 fewer vehicles roughly through this intersection than we do with the other alternatives we're looking at. 
So I, I meant to write down the numbers, but I believe we're getting about 7,000 vehicles per hour through this intersection. And maybe Scott can correct me later if, if he has that available data. I think it's like 6,300 or something with this option. So because we're not getting vehicles through the through this intersection as well, it's backing up. Um, you can see on the westbound, we're backing up uh, past San Francisco, almost to LaRue Street. Lone Tree backs all the way up to Route 66. Um, this is considered significant impacts. Now we're impacting ADOT's facilities. Um, this would be a very hard sell when we go back to them with, with this and let them know that traffic backup may impact movements on Route 66. We haven't fully evaluated what this impact Route 66 is in our models, um, but it's likely there is some impact on some of the movements coming through this intersection at 66 and Lone Tree. Uh, southbound, we're up past Franklin, not quite to Sawmill, and the eastbound isn't as, as affected as much. Again, this is sim traffic balancing the intersection timings to get the most vehicles through the intersection as possible using a network level view. Um, so th th this, is, this is the biggest impact, um, dropping that, the northbound and westbound double lefts. We also did look at <clears throat> a shared through right scenario at the request of sustainability. We don't have renderings for that, but if we did take away that channelized right, because we have a shared right instead, so the right turn users use the through lane to make a shared right movement. Um, we have very similar queues. They don't change much, but in general operations for vehicles going through the intersection degrade a little bit more. We get even fewer um, vehicles through that intersection using that concept. Um, and those models are very preliminary. They're not fully seated for pedestrians, so you have an additional potential impact that we weren't able to incorporate for, for this meeting. That if you do have heavy pedestrian usage and a pedestrian is in the crosswalk and you can't make that right turn lane and that right turn user cannot make that right turn movement, you could potentially at that point increase queues. But we haven't modeled that yet. Um, that's just potential impact that we recognize may occur depending on the number of um, pedestrians that would be anticipated at this intersection during the peak hour. Um, so here's the build out for a single left intersection. Very similar again to the full build out, mainly because we replaced the uh, left turn lane with the median to provide refuge islands. Um, big focus again is look curb to curb is what we're trying to focus is the core of the intersection and it's definitely smaller than 66 and 4th Street. So that's the big takeaway we wanna look at with this comparison. Then we looked at a, a fourth look. We recognize that you know we're impacting those right away issues. We're impacting this property up here. We're impacting this parcel here. We're impacting this parking lot. What if we took a balanced approach between traditional and the full build out? Is there a way we can give some of the benefits of these improvements while minimizing impacts to property owners along Butler? So this was our approach to that um, intersection concept. I mean, you can see from here the best. We're not basically we took out the right turn channelized on the northeast corner, so we're not impacting this property anymore. So we don't have to demo this building. Uh, we're keeping cyclists on the on Butler, so we we're not pulling them onto the sidewalks. We're no longer impacting this driveway, and then we were also able to shorten this channelized right some because cyclists are being kept on Butler. We don't have to modify this curb line as much so we can keep driveway access to this parking lot. We still have potentially a minor impact, uh, but not as great an impact as the other concepts. So that's the takeaway from this concept. Going through the renderings, uh, again, this building is saved. We're keeping uh, cyclists on the roadway along Butler. So it's gonna, they're gonna use the intersection in a similar manner as they are now. We do still provide protected crossings north-south along the Foots Trail. And we do have a channelized uh, right in the southwest corner. In the future, if warranted, the city could come back um, potentially and add a right channelized on the northeast corner in the future. It would be compatible with that, but this concept doesn't necessarily require that at this point. 
we used to have a right turn lane on the westbound direction. It's just not channelized. So going through the intersection, yeah. um, facing west, the eastbound direction, we got a channelized right, two through lanes, and a, a eastbound left, and then two opposing through movements, and then westbound on the facing east. We got a dedicated right, but it's not channelized. Two through lanes, cyclists again are on the roadway. Double uh, westbound left and two opposing through movements. No refuge island. We're back to a just a double stripe uh, median line. Crossing is back up to the traditional crossing length of 91 feet and a walking time of 26 seconds. So we're back up similar to the traditional intersection from a pedestrian use perspective. On the north flag, we have a double southbound left, uh, right turn lane, double southbound through movements and two opposing through movements. Then northbound, we have a uh, dedicated right, two through movements, northbound left and two opposing through movements. And we do have uh, protected crossing on the, the south side because we do have the channelized right in this corner. Uh, we still have a distance of 91 feet on the north leg <clears throat> with a time of 26 seconds. So again, very similar traditional from a pedestrian worst case pers perspective. Um, so on the north leg and west leg, very similar, or on the east leg, very similar traditional, south leg and west leg, very similar to the full build out. So where the foot's trail is, it, it is going to act similar to the full build out where the foot's trail is not located on the east side. It's going to act similar to tr traditional. So that's why we're calling it balance. It's sort of taking two ideas and combining the two. Available green times again, 32 seconds with the pedestrian crossing time of 26 seconds. So there is sufficient time for a pedestrian to cross in one corresponding green, green cycle. A quick look at this intersection. You can see we have traditional corners on the northwest and northeast. This building is saved. It, it was meant to be re-rendered. Um, so you imagine it's back re-rendered like the traditional, like that. That's what it, it should look like. Um, and coming through, the bikes are back on Butler. Again, a traditional corner on the south southeast. And coming around to the southwest is where we have our channelized right, but because we are keeping bikes on Butler, we're able to shorten this approach and potentially save the driveway uh, to this parcel here and not impact this parking lot. And because again, we're keeping bicycles on Butler in their current condition, we're not impacting this parcel here by allowing the driveway to stay on this um, at its current location. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is we did have uh, some 2019, fall of 2019, I believe, bicycle data. And in this area, I'm going to try to go back to the sheet there with me where we have that info. I'm just getting an idea of the amount of cyclists we might expect going through this area. Um, yeah, fall 2019 bike count. This is a 14 hour bike count, so it's not a peak hour count. It's a, a full days or 14 hour count. But along Route 66 up near Blackbird, we had about 650 cyclists counted. So that's not quite in our project area, but that was on the north, north end of our project. And then at the Butler Sawmill intersection, just east of this project, we had 200 cyclists counted. So that's about the volume you might anticipate coming through these intersections. Um, once we connect Foots Trail north to south, we would potentially expect those numbers to go up because we are providing additional Foots Trail connectivity. Um, that's sort of the magnitude of cyclists and that we might see in this area. And we understand there's additional development going on, <clears throat> so these numbers may change. But that's the that's the best data we have is from fall of 2019 at this time. So we just want to give that for a sense of scale for number of users. Um, performance, we're back to similar conditions like traditional and full build out, level service D and E at 2026 and 2040. Vehicle delays are right around 48 seconds again, and queue lengths are in the 480 foot range. Vehicle delays are back to similar at 59 hours and 56 gallons of gas used going through the intersection. So, very similar to tr traditional or full build out. 
Um, here's the Q diagram. West, uh, eastbound, we're backed up just past Eldon Street, not to Larry quite yet. Northbound, uh, backed up north of Churchill. We are backed up a little bit past Windsor in this condition, and then Lone Tree's a little bit more backed up than some of the other um, conditions. We're out more north past Brandon for the left turn lanes. And here's the comparison um, to the 4th Street and Route 66. Again, north and east, a little bit smaller when you look at the intersections. The, the width is very similar on the east leg. But again, Foots Trails, primary connections on the west side, and this is because of the channelized uh, right turn lane is significantly smaller if you consider curb to median refuge and median refuge to curb. So that's sort of how we're trying to, so the concept we're trying to get across here. Um, so here's where we talk about channelized rights to go back to Madam Chair's question. So channelized rights, what are we doing here and how do they work? Um, again, these aren't intended to be slip lanes. And we did rely on FHWA, Federal Highway Administration's PED safe guidelines. So the Pedestrian Safety Guide and Countermeasure Selection System. So this is a published guideline of how you install and how you design these channelized islands to protect the pedestrian and cyclists using these crosswalks. That's how all of our uh, channelized rights are laid out. Um, pedestrian benefits is that it does reduce the distance for crossing the main road. So again, that's why we show distances to the inside curb of these islands. Um, the geometric design, because we're pulling off and we have the double curvature, it does reduce speed. In general, for vehicle speeds, it's not intended to be a free flow right turn lane. They're not pulling into their own lane and then merging with traffic. They do have to stop and yield. Um, and there are different ways to control this, and we'll get into that in a second. But it is not a slip lane. <clears throat> it's not free flow. And it does optimize driver's sight line to the crosswalk. So as they're coming into this intersection, they're now perpendicular to the crosswalk. We have a staging area to the right where they can identify the pedestrian or cyclist waiting here and yield to those um, pedestrians or cyclists. Um, it's just a better angle. It's it's very clear what you're coming across. It's very clear there's a crossing. You're channelized. Uh, drivers generally naturally slow down once you channelize them in, a, in similar situations, similar to what we would see at roundabouts or used for traffic calming measures for other uh, locations. Um, pedestrian challenges, we do recognize that these types of crossings are difficult for visually impaired to detect oncoming traffic. And that's why we want to talk for a second about different control measures for this right turn lane. Um, so there are three alternatives for how we control the right turn movements. Uh, we can go to yield control, and that's where the vehicle is required to yield to pedestrians and oncoming traffic. So um, the driver does have to be aware that this staging area and the crosswalk has preferential treatment and they have to yield to pedestrians using this crossing. But it is a yield control, not a full stop control. Second option is to provide a stop control. And then as they pass this, they can either be that a yield or a secondary stop <coughs> um, crossing for vehicles. So they would have to come to a full stop before they cross the crosswalk and then try to enter the, the crossing street. Um, third, and this is how we currently have this modeled in our networks, is a signalized um, crossing. And so a right turn key would have to come and stop, and they're only allowed to proceed when they have the signal to go. Uh, the biggest difference from a pedestrian perspective is that in the yield and stop control, the pedestrians can cross at any time. Um, they feel safe to cross. Signalized crossing, because this does allow for a green signal phase for right turn users for vehicles they would only be allowed to cross when there's a, a red on for the right turn movements so there's a potential they would have to queue here wait for a phase and then if there's not significant enough or not enough time to cross they may have to do a two-step crossing whereas on the stop and yield control they can cross when the car is yielded to them or stopped can cross and then they prepare to stage here for the crossing across the intersection so those are the three options. We have modeled it as signalized. All three prioritize the pedestrian over the vehicle. Um, they all have three different levels of safety from a pedestrian perspective and a user perspective. 
they all do depend on decision making of the vehicle driver. Um, biggest challenges for each is again with the yield. If you have visually impaired, it may be a little bit difficult for them to determine when a car is recognized and fully yielded and stopped to them. Versus a stop where it's maybe a little bit more obvious that a vehicle is stopped at a stop sign or at a signal. Um, for the stop control, as vehicles approach and stop here, they're then going to want to squeeze out to, for better sight lines, and they may end up blocking as they now yield to go into the intersection. And then for signalized, again, it may delay a pedestrian entering the intersection, and it may cause a two-step crossing. So those are sort of the pros and cons for each three of these. We have not decided yet from a design team which is preferred. That's some of the input we're looking here tonight to see if there's an, any general feedback on preference for these three. Um, so that is one of the, the input points we are looking for. <clears throat> um, an example of this type of crossing is uh, Boulder, Colorado. They use these types of channelized crossings quite a bit in Boulder. They have a heavy college population. Um, they have a lot of pet and bike infrastructure, similar the goals of Flagstaff. Um, so if you go to Google Maps and look around their city, they have a lot of these types of intersections. Um, so this is an intersection of Pearl Street and 36 or 28th Street. And you can see at all four corners, they have these channelized rights. Um, they also do implement a speed table. So the crosswalk is raised. It's an enhanced visual measure and an enhanced measure to slow down traffic. And in general, uh, Boulder, Colorado does use the yield control for all of their channelized rights. Again, the benefit is um, enhanced <coughs> traffic and pedestrian users crossing through here. Uh, we have reached out to the traffic engineer to sort of discuss lessons learned from their use of these. We have not talked to them yet, but that's one of our project goals is to sort of discuss this particular issue with them a little bit more in depth. But this is fairly common for Boulder, um, and they keep this is a, a fairly this is a newer installation, so they seem to have success with the yield control. Um, there is no formal guidance from the, the federal guidance level of which one's preferred. It's really down to an agency level decision what type of control is preferred. It answers the questions for the channelized rights and and the different options we have to look at it to to from a pedestrian safety perspective and then a operability perspective from the driver. If not, I'm happy to try to answer questions. Um, so alternatives and takeaways. <clears throat> so all the intersections that we looked at do have sufficient green time to allow for pedestrians to cross in one cycle. Um, that was something we wanted to focus on as we didn't want people to have to feel they had to stop in the refuge. This is based on a crossing speed from published data based on a wheelchair user. Um, using the intersection, but we did make sure there was sufficient green time in all of the intersections we modeled. All of the footprints are smaller than the comparable 4th Street and Route 66 intersections, just to give everyone a visualization of what those intersections might be for comparison. Also smaller than Ponderosa with Butler and 66. Um, those with the channelized rights have a smaller feel overall just by shortening the crossing distance from the channelized right island to the opposite side but all four intersections are smaller. All intersection alternatives have protected pedestrian and cyclist crossings on the north-south direction along the Foots Trail, and they have prote protected crossings for pedestrians along Butler Avenue. Two of the four have protected cyclist crossings as well. Um, the two that don't have protected cyclist crossings, or pedestrian crossings, I'm sorry. The two that don't have protected cyclist crossings are the traditional and the balanced. They, they keep the cyclists on the street. Um, channelized right islands, refuge islands do decrease the crossing distances for pedestrians and generally improve safety. It improves the right turn lane user's viewpoint, better identifies there are pedestrians in the area. It generally has been thought to encourage safety for pedestrian crossers when the, the posing movement is uh, in, in relation to the right turn user for the vehicle. Um, and then we discussed the three options for how we would channel, use the channelized right stop, yield, or signalized. The big takeaway is the stop or yield control allows pedestrians to cross at any time they feel safe. The signalized does stop that movement until they have a free right. 
or do they have a red light for the, the right turn lane? So it, it does break up that crossing potentially. Um, and then in general, there's a significant increase in vehicle delays for the single left intersection alternative. And then just to add to that, when we do combine the through and the right, we did see similar delay increases just from reduction of volume of vehicles we get through the intersection when we go a combination through movement and right turn lane. I didn't mention for the balance intersection, we did also look at that intersection with a comparable through and right turn movement. Q links weren't significantly impacted. Again, um, it did rebalance the, the cycle times and we did see a deg degradation in level of service and the number of vehicles that got through the intersection. But we do have um, those sort of Q length tables if anyone's interested to see for the combination through right turn lanes. And finally, I think this is our last slide. This is the summary. I know I've given a lot of data. It's been probably hard to keep everything straight, so we tried our best to summarize it. Um, but here is sort of the, the takeaway. So with regards to protected separated bicycle facilities, the full build out and single left turn lane options provide those protected separated facilities on all legs, whereas balanced and traditional only provided protected by and separated bicycle facilities on the north south legs. So that's the, the big difference in this first lane or first line. Pedestrian crossing length times are generally similar for all four intersections. We do get a reduction of about a second and a half for a crossing pedestrian in the full build out and single left turn lanes due to the reduction in crossing time to the refuge islands. And this is based on the, the longest distance the user has to cross. So there are some legs that will definitely be shorter on these two options compared to the other two, but this is the longest distance we're showing here. Total fuel, fuel used, again, going back to the carbon neutrality thought process, and we can't really analyze intersections for a VMT condition, but we can uh, use synchro and sim traffic to estimate gallons used and relay that back to carbon neutrality. The single left turn lanes have a significant increase in gallons per hour of fuel in the peak hours. This isn't going to be all day long. This is the peak hour. I do want to emphasize that with an increase of almost 30 gallons per hour. Um, per day um, due to loss of capacity of vehicles through the intersection. Vehicle user delays generally the same for alternatives one, two, and three, or one, two, and four, with again an increase in the single left turn lanes. Again, that's just the intersection capacity gets reduced with the loss of the double lefts. And then we did go through the right-of-way impacts. <clears throat> the two biggest right-of-way impacts are the full build-out and single left turn lanes. Uh, with impacts at all three corners, whereas the balance only had impact at the southwest corner. We did run some preliminary construction costs if we were to build the entire intersection, just to provide that data. This, these costs do not include right-of-way impacts, um, but generally not a significant cost difference between the four intersections, but right-of-way, I did talk to Ames's right-of-way uh, consultants and oh. roughly, Right away costs for the full build out single left turn lanes are somewhere between three seven hundred fifty thousand and one and a half million dollars if we impact all three parcels equally. The balance is reduced uh, to probably closer to a half million dollar range. Um, these are just high level estimates. We have not done a full estimate. That's just based on building demo, loss of driveway access, and then reconstruction of a parking lot and access um, loss off of Butler, loss of the 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 you know, access to Butler Drive itself being a fronting street and a heavy commercial street and having to have access elsewhere. So those are just sort of high level costs based on other project costs that are potentially impacting this project, but not included in these numbers. Um, and with that, I think we want to open up to questions. I have all four slides up so we can go back and answer questions. Um, but I grabbed the wrong one there, but I'd like to open it up to the group for questions or comments at this point. We, we do want to track them all, so appreciate everyone's time. I hope, I know I had a lot to cover. I hope I covered it clearly, but happy to answer anyone's questions if there are any. Thank you, Jason. And I know we've received a lot of questions and comments, or you have, the team has. And so, um, you know, the presentation was was full of a, of a lot of information to try to address some of those 
comments and questions we've received so far on the project. Um, so what I would like to do is um, ask if there are questions, clarifications needed from our commissioners or committee members at this time. Um, so I'd like to ask those questions first. And then once we get through those questions, I'm going to open it up for general public comment and we'll go through general public comment. I'm going to close public comment and then we'll go into discussion between the commissioners and the committee members. So let's start with the um, commissioners and committee members. And I think the first question, um, Susan Heffel, who is our uh, chair of the Bicycle Advisory Committee, uh, has a question. So we'll start with. Um, Chair Heffel, are you are you still with us, Susan? I am. OK, yes. uh, so um, well, my question goes back to when uh, I believe. Um, he was talking about the greenhouse gas uh, estimates that were made, and I was wondering in the various scenarios, and I was wondering if all of those greenhouse gas estimates included the cost of construction and maintenance of the of the entire project that that is a good question we have not included the the impacts of construction itself at this time no okay thanks do you have any other questions about the presentation oh, oh i have lots <laughs> i'm not sure if i can questions, articulate are, all questions of them. are good but if there's discussion items or comments i just want to hold those until yeah. after we hear from members of the public Okay. But if you have questions, please go ahead. Well, just let me put one more in, and that is, um, so with the, um, th okay, the not the not slip lanes, the channelized right Channel turns. Um, so what is the actual good of them? It seemed like there were a lot of issues with them. Uh, what do you see as the benefit of them that, that uh, uh, it works in spite of you know, taking up more uh, acreage and making uh, crossings, they seem to be fairly convoluted. Yeah, so the, the biggest benefit to these channelized rights, and I'm trying to figure out which is the best one to see is probably this rendering. Um, so if you're a pedestrian coming uh, along the foots trail coming from the south, and let's say if you're in the stop or yield condition, you, you don't have any right turns, you can cross and you can stage at this island. And so now you're staged here. When you're crossing then uh, this west leg, you're crossing one fewer lanes. We went from a 90 foot crossing to a 76 foot crossing. You're, you're eliminating uh, distance. And I think I can show that um, traditional. We're about an 88 foot crossing with no channelized right because we have the right turn lane in line with all the other lanes. If we add the channelized right, you can come from the south. You can cross stage here. When I see stage, just means sit here and wait for the cross signal to cross safely. You've now gone from an 88 foot distance to a 70 foot distance. You're also crossing one fewer lane of traffic. So the feeling from a pedestrian and cyclist perspective is a smaller intersection while still providing the same volume capacity to the intersection uh, to get through the intersection. Um, one of the biggest things I touched on it lightly when we looked at a shared through right turn lane is that now you're combining two different movements you're stopping traffic to make that right turn movement so you're losing intersection speed and you're just in general your through movement gets degraded so you're not having to adjust your through green times your your left turn green times to get to balance your your movements when you have a dedicated right you can pull traffic out of the through movements they can now run continuously unless we have backup blocking them um, they can run continuously at a set speed. They can queue here to make their movements. They could also potentially make their movements during breaks in traffic of the opposing traffic. So you can get more volume of traffic through here. But having the channelized rights from a pedestrian perspective lets you treat it as if that right turn lane's not there in a way, because now you've taken it away from this main crossing. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So um have, do you have any statistics on whether which of those uh, crossings is safer for the pedestrians and the bi bicyclists? Um, I'm going to ask Joe Vaskovic. Joe, are you able? I know you looked into the safety measures and the guidelines more than I did. Do you, do you know if there's any published safety data on these? Uh, yes, Jason. Uh, the, one of the reports on the channelized right turns 
uh, said the channelized right turns is comparable uh, to the shared uh, through and right turn uh, with the separate right turn lane next to the through traffic as having a little higher crash incidents. Uh, I think that they didn't go into much details uh, about what caused that added crash uh, frequency. So uh, the channelized right turn was similar to the share and through in that report uh, that dealt with the design of these channelized right turns. And does adding a uh, raised table make them any safer? I'm not sure uh, regarding the safety of adding the uh, table, but it does uh, help control some of the speed. It helps make it a little easier for uh, pedestrians and cyclists and uh, uh, those with disabilities to cross that channelization because uh, you're not having to deal with the curb or uh, ramps. It's also with the raised crosswalk, it's a visual indicator to the users that the pedestrians have priority. You know, they're seeing a table for crosswalks. It's a visual di difference that they're seeing as they approach. So again, I don't know the safety data, but it is used quite often as a traffic calming measure when used in local neighborhoods to put these mm -hmm. safety t speed tables in in high pedestrian areas to, to accent and you know highlight the crossing. Um, but yeah, I don't know if we have hard safety data numbers to give you, but it is, it's a visual yeah. cue. It's a speed control measure. Um, we're trying to enhance as much visual information as possible that, hey, there's pedestrians that are using this crossing and please be aware. Yeah. And I have used uh, those intersections that you showed on the presentation in Boulder and in Denver. And I guess as a pedestrian, I, I can shrug my shoulders because I'm not intimidated by intersections the way some people are. But and, and those are the ones that you have to be worrying about more. OK, thanks. Thank you. All right, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, commissioners, committee members, just put a Q or a C in the comments to let me know if you do have a question um, before we open up for public comment. But um, Kim Austin is on our, our BAC. Um, so committee, committee member, Kim, did we get your question answered? Do you have any other questions? I do, I was just curious, can you hear me? I sure can. Oh, good, okay. So I was just curious, Jason, if there's um, a different place where you're going to stop the bicycles, like um, their stop bar, is that a di is it a different location than the vehicles so that visually bikes are put ahead so that um, they're a little bit more, you know, visual to the uh, vehicles. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's going to depend on the intersection type. Um, so for the full build out, they're actually being pulled off the road and then they're set up in staging areas highlighted by these red intersections. So I think your question is probably more geared towards when we keep them on the street. Is that correct? Well, some of the places, um, I guess, going through an intersection, right? I guess the full build, I mean, even the full build out isn't aren't they going through or how are you having them cross in the full build out versus the traditional then i guess so full build out um like i said we pull them off the roadway they can stage here then they can cross like a pedestrian would cross and they can stay on their bike because they have a dedicated crossing so we are anticipating they're at a different speed than someone walking in the white crossings those are these green cross crosswalks are um so they would pull off cross and then cross again and then continue back onto the street further on to the east if you're on butler for example uh, for foots trail coming from the, the north you come south again you'd stage wait for your signal cross and then if you want to go east you could cross again or if you want to go south you cross and then continue on um, we do have i know joe you had a full build out so this may look a little bit um, so these are bicycle paths and that's what the arrows are showing. So that's just sort of what I described. If you're coming from the west, you would follow this area, this arrow, and again use the dedicated crosswalk. So you can see for the full build out, and that's what this is showing. Everyone's contained within the green crosswalks for as a cyclist, and you would tr use it just like a pedestrian would crossing. Could you please zoom in just a little bit on the intersection? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, of course. 
Um, so you can see all, all movements behave almost like you would if you were a pedestrian crossing the intersection on the full build out. If we go to a traditional, um, it changes a little bit. So when you're going north south, again, it's going to behave a little bit similar. You're going to stay in the green crosswalks. Um, then if you want to go east or west, you would stage in the green crosswalk. And Joe, correct me if I'm wrong anywhere here, uh, while the stop bar is behind the green crosswalk. So yes, you would stage in front. Um, uh, in, in that case, uh, Jason, they would behave like a vehicle and stop at the stop bar uh, in the green oh, pavement okay. marking, yes. Oh, back here, okay. Right. Um, but we did also look for um, east-west cyclists you know, potential bike boxes. So that you could stop here to stage for a left turn crossing, um, carrying them through to use dedicated crossing. So we are starting to look through this for those same questions. Um, Joe, do you know, is, is there any reason we couldn't stage them in front of the stop bar? Or is that just something we need to look at a little bit closer or on the green crosswalk? I could look at that a little bit closer. Usually, uh, the the staging for the bikes in, in front of the uh, the car stop there um, for uh, like single lane uh, roadways, uh, much smaller traffic volume. Okay. So yeah, we're we're just now getting into to this sort of flow diagram, but it's something we can look at. But we are starting to look at it. But I, I hope you can see the. The general thought is of how everyone, I know this is sort of a confusing diagram if you're just looking at it the first time. Okay, so just to be clear, and this is it, and I'll get off, Julie, I'm sorry. Yep. So, um, okay, so if in this traditional method, my options, if I'm on Butler and I would like to um, turn left onto Lone Tree, so my options are to you um, travel like a vehicle in the left turn lane, exit the bike lane, get into the left, and then, or stay in the bike lane and then cross as a pedestrian through all the different crossings. And I have to wait, 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 wait to get across. Is that correct? I'm just, I just want to make sure. Yeah. So for Butler, um, if, say you're going eastbound, you have the option, yes, to enter as a vehicle and make a normal left turn lane or tur turn movement as if you were a vehicle. And then you would enter the the northbound cycle movement here. Um, you could come off to this staging area if you want to get in the foots trail. So this is what you're seeing with this diagram is you're exiting the right turn lane and then staging and then you would come through the bicycle crossing with the other cyclists that are using foots trail. So that's your uh, east to north movement onto the foots trail. Um, you also have the option if you want to go to the the east side foots trail, which is a northbound uh, cycle lane. Um, one thing we are, and again, we're just starting to investigate this. You can go through the intersection in the bike lane, stage at a bike box potentially. Um, we're still talking about this because it sets up in front of the right turn movement. Or you could stage into the bicycle crossing staging area here and then cross north. So this we haven't fully decided, but there's two potential options of where to stage if you're trying to get to this intersection. So you have sort of three options. Um, they all end up if you're on Butler and going northbound onto the Foots Trail on the west side or the bike lane on the east side. Come in east or westbound and you're in the bike lane and you want to go northbound here, you would enter the right turn lane and then enter uh, the bike path through the curb cut on this corner. So that's your northbound movement. If you want to enter Foots Trail northbound, you would pass through the intersection and the bike lane and then enter through this curb cut. Now you're on the Foots Trail. If you want to enter southbound Foots Trail, again, you would have potentially an option for a bike box or you would stage in this corner and then cross uh, with the other cyclists through the cycle crosswalk and then enter southbound. Or you have the uh, other option to enter as a uh, uh, like a, a vehicle would and enter the, the left turn lane, come across, and then you would enter the foots trail on your left turn movement. So you have multiple options on how to get to the northbound and south or the east and west sides for the north and south directions. Um, we haven't fully decided or vetted the bike box concept, but we are 
starting to vet that process. And since the um, the full build out, the time the sh it's shorter to cross, and you're crossing like a pedestrian in the full build out, then okay. All right, I'm going to work that out in my head. Go ahead, Julie. I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. Go ahead. I appreciate your questions, Kim. All right, uh, we have Transportation Commissioner Morley who has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My question is about smart signals. And um, in the model, have we accounted for new technology that allows us to adapt in real time and perhaps advance some of the traffic that's shown in some of the intersections or make that better? Joe, I'm going to defer to you on this one. Yeah, is that uh, regard to uh, the vehicle traffic or uh, the pedestrian and bike traffic? Sorry, in regards to some of the cross sections having worse um, vehicle traffic, like single lane lefts, et cetera, like how can smart signal technology help us mitigate some of that, or is it already accounted for? Uh, it's accounted for in our, our modeling of the actuated uh, intersection. And when I say actuated, I'm assuming that the signal timing is going to adjust the volume of traffic on the approaches. It's not going to a fixed. Uh, amount of the green time, for example, if there's uh, backups in a turn lane, uh, the signal will adapt and, and change the timing to, to a certain extent within the limits that, that we'd give it. So uh, uh, there are cameras uh, that we could put at the intersections uh, uh, that could be connected to even a, a central uh, control area, uh, we could coordinate signals, uh, and we can have the signals uh, adapt to the timing to the traffic volumes. And just to follow up, so I believe um, from that, our SIM traffic models are optimized, so they would behave as if these uh, intersection and the network are all linked together and behaving uh, at the optimized, most optimized condition, correct? Yeah, that's the way uh, we, we set up the, the model. So, so these don't directly, uh, okay, they don't directly, um, or Commissioner, they don't directly uh, have the actuated signals where they're tied together, but the way our model behaves is it's trying to find the most efficient path and in real time through these, this intersection network. And that's one of the benefits of, of using some traffic and setting up the way we did is we're trying to find the most optimal path through this intersection and balancing the other intersection timings, this intersection timing. Um, to make sure everything's working as a unit together. Um, so to clarify, so it's optimized to the best of its ability, but with the way smart signals are adapting, there may still be op the model doesn't fully understand that, so there may still be opportunities in the future. But so just if we do smart, if we do like real time smart signal connected yeah. technology, it, it it could likely do better than what the model's capable of managing, even though the model's optimizing things. Yeah, it sounds like Scott, I went over other traffic engineers wants to chime in. So Scott. Yeah, yeah. so this is Scott. Um, so the the information that we've reported um, throughout this presentation has been the, the PM peak hour, um, which is basically what we're predicting to be kind of the, the worst case scenario or the controlling um, scenario. I think there's definitely improvements um, or benefits that could be had with the smart signals and, and having uh, signal controllers that are adaptive, but where you're, where you're going to see that benefit is in the off-peak hours. So um, what, what we're looking at right now is worst case scenarios in terms of queuing, worst case scenarios in terms of delay, um, which, is that, which is that peak hour commute. Um, but in in the off peak or you know the other you know 23 hours of the day, I think smart signals could be a benefit because they would they would be better able to adjust to fluctuations in that that traffic volume. Thank you. We have a bicycle advisory committee member Estella Hollander. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I actually have two questions now. First one is related to this peak hour. Um, I guess, is it just like literally one hour or what hours are being considered? Scott, I think you're closest to this. Do you want to 
describe the what the peak hour is and maybe how it relates or compares to the a.m peak hour and afternoon peak hour yeah so um typically when we're looking at traffic operations we're looking at uh the the two peak hours and um as we define it you know in in, in traffic engineering the a.m peak hour is one one hour um somewhere typically within kind of that 7 a.m to 9 a.m uh representative of your morning commute and then the p.m peak hour is a representative one hour somewhere typically with that within kind of that 4 p.m to 6 p.m um representative of the evening commute hour so so yeah when when we talk about peak hour um usually we're looking at both a.m and p.m peak hours uh what we've uh what we presented this evening is the p.m peak hour which uh typically typically we're seeing the higher volumes um in that hour compared to the to the am and scott do you have a rough um comparative value of the difference between pm and am is it a significant difference or no um i mean just kind of order of magnitude um when we're looking at the peak hour um usually it's kind of in I, it generally it kind of in the 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 10 to 12 percent um of the daily volume so when we're looking at kind of at those peaks um those peak hours are about 10 to 12 percent of the entire day okay thank you yeah i guess what what i'm getting at um i personally find all the examples overbuilt so I, i'm trying to understand i guess maybe what that span is of where we'd see these delays and i guess it comes down to like a policy decision if we're willing to accept some of these longer delays if it really is just for two hours or if that you know feeds into um you know maybe it ends up being three to seven or, or whatever that range ends up being um so that's kind of where i was getting at with that question and then second question is related to the first part of the presentation um regarding greenhouse gas emissions i believe it was slides uh, 14 and 15. i'm curious why 2040 was left out of the the chart um, we had that information when we previously presented. I'm happy to, to discuss those. We focus on 2026 for this presentation specifically because we uh, focused on the zero VMT goals at this part of the discussion. Um, for 2040, we did see as as volumes are projected to increase. So let me uh, find the. Uh, yeah, so you can see between 26 and 2040, there is a significant increase in vehicle miles traveled. So with that would come a corresponding increase in um, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. What we did find in our previous analysis that we presented to mayor and council is that by 2040, the savings you're seeing here, if if the population growth and commercial growth that we modeled in, into 2040, you would see most of these greenhouse gas reductions go away. Um, what, you know, step back even further for the four lane, you get a bigger reduction in the 2026 year. And I believe we actually had a slight increase in greenhouse gas emissions in 2040 for the two lane scenario. We had a smaller increase in the 2026 year, just like what you're seeing here, 285 versus 122. But we did see a continued reduction in 2040 with it ultimately becoming an increase, I believe it was in 2046 or 2047 is when it goes away. goes away. So you get a smaller reduction up front, but you get a longer effect overall, uh, again, based on the trends that go, that are assumed for the 2040 model. But because we were recognizing that the city has this goal of a zero VMT growth, we really wanted to focus on the 2026 year for this presentation. Okay, thank you. We have Sustainability Commissioner John Daly has a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, did I hear you correctly that we're going to do questions first and then comments later on? Is that correct? Correct. We're just going to get okay. some questions out, then we'll do a full public comment, and then we'll have Commissioner discussion. 
Okay, so a couple questions. Uh, going back to the, the peak hour concept, is that uh, an average of the peak hour across the year, or is it kind of, uh, you know, the worst, you know, let's say the, the, the evening peak hour uh, when, you know, snowflake traffic is the worst of, of the year. Is it a, a peak hour of the year, or is it an average of the peak hour of all the days? Scott, I'm going to defer to you on this one as well. Sure. Um, so what we're using is a peak hour of um, an average across the year. So there, there could be, and and particularly with you know with Flagstaff, there could be um, days that are abnormally higher than that, um, or abnormally lower than that. But what this is is kind of an average throughout the year. Um, derived from the the ADT, which is your average daily traffic. Um, you know, so, sometimes recreational areas, um, particularly Flagstaff, if you get, you know, snow days and everybody from Phoenix comes up, um, then then yeah, there will be days where traffic is is worse than what we're predicting. Um, there there's very well could be days um, where it's where it's better. Um, it'll also fluctuate, you know, d depending on what day of the week or, you know, whether it's a weekend or or whatnot. So, so the volumes that we're we're analyzing right now are an average, um, kind of a typical day throughout the year. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question: uh, Do all of these crossings assume the use of? Uh, I'm not sure what the traffic engineer term is, but they're commonly referred to as beg buttons where pedestrians, you know, if they show up one second too late to cross the street, they uh, to push the button, they have to wait for a full cycle. Like, so there's all these designs that assume that or not. Joe, uh, I'll defer to you, I think, on this one. I think... Yeah, we, we haven't gotten into the details, like, uh, of uh, push, being able to push the button and extend the crossing time. Uh, that, that's something definitely we could look at when we get into the details of the final design. Uh, but th there are, technologies out there that will let you extend uh, some of those uh, clearances, uh, clearance times for pedestrians. Would, would it materially impact the traffic modeling if it was uh, you know, just default cross signal like it is downtown? Joe or Scott, uh, I'm sure. Uh, we'd be uh, changing the, the crossing time within a certain uh, set of parameters so not to uh, really impact the, the vehicle traffic, if that's uh, what you're asking. Uh, uh, the, the, the other way, I'm asking, like, how, how can we make it so pedestrians don't, uh, you know, pedestrians and cyclists are waiting for a minute and a half or however long the cycle is because they missed the button by two seconds. Yeah, I think I, I, I think there would be um, cases like that if you know if you show up um, in the middle of the cycle, um, you would have to push a button. Uh, the the traffic signal controller would register that there's a you know a, a pedestrian call, and then they would provide you know the the next cycle would provide that pedestrian crossing time. But in general, the the vehicular cycle and and how it rotates through um, the different phases for for vehicles would not be truncated for pedestrians it would it would continue through its normal cycle um, it would just know that there was a pedestrian waiting there and it would it would provide the pedestrian um, signal you know the, the hand and walk um, signals when it gets to that stage of the the traffic signal yeah, so it's it's only going to signal the pedestrian it's safe to cross if he's there in time to cross safely, basically. So we don't want them yeah. actuated and then crossing when they're halfway through the cycle. Then he potentially gets trapped. Right, Scott? Did I say that correctly? Yeah. 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 yeah I, I think, well, that's, that's one way to think of it. But, you know, I think pedestrians, you know, with, with those slick countdown timers that have been kind of the norm for the last few decades are pretty adept at knowing whether they've got time. And that's doubly so for cyclists who kind of look on a different time scale. Uh, so I think that's probably a, a gap in terms of uh, ele elevating the needs of, uh, of, of pedestrians and cyclists so that they're not second-class citizens. So 
sorry, sorry to speak in a comment there. Thank you. No, I appreciate that input. It's definitely like like Joe said, we're not in final design yet, so those are good comments for us to to bring in and consider uh, for so, final design considerations. So we need to um, let's just stick with questions. We've got a lot of people um, that are joining us tonight that are waiting to make comments. So Commissioner Daly, do you have any other any other questions before we move into public comment? I do not. Thank you, Chair Daly. Thank you. All right. Um, I do have one question from uh, Metroplan. Uh, Mr. Wessel, Dave, if you're still here, would you like to ask your question about safety analyses? Uh, yeah, I, I thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And let me just start uh, by saying thank you for an excellent and very comprehensive presentation. Um, this has uh, been very, very insightful. Uh, I think the um, yeah. So I, I have a follow up question, but the the question about safety analysis um, are we to see one uh, forthcoming? It doesn't it doesn't sound like one has been done yet, and I'm wondering if one will be done. Joe, I'll defer to you on this one. Uh, no, we we haven't uh, completed a safety uh, analysis yet. Uh, Currently, uh, it's not part of our traffic impact analysis. Uh, I think we, we could look at certain aspects of the intersection design, and how it relates to uh, crash reductions, and uh, see if we could provide, provide you with some input uh, uh, regarding that for the different intersection configurations that we have. OK, thank, thank you. And, and Madam Chair, if I could ask one more question before I go. Um, so. <clears throat> Uh, Jason, um, when this process started and your presentation started, you mentioned the Metro plan model and one of the challenges early on, um, you were running into capacity um, challenges. And so, so you made a decision and I supported you in it to shift some traffic back over to Beaver and San Francisco uh, just because that's going to be what drivers do when there's excessive congestion. They find those alternate routes. And so my question relative to the single left alternative, when you started introducing those extreme queues and congestion again, uh, did you shift more traffic to Beaver, San Francisco and back to Ponderosa Parkway? Or did you maintain the same volumes throughout all four alternatives? Um, I'll let Scott talk to it. I know we stuck to a sim traffic level evaluation, but Scott, do you want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, the 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 volume stayed the same. Um, we the the sim traffic basically is just modeling what the what the delay in queues would result if that volume goes through um, the intersection with the single lifts. Um, to your point, if you know if they do get that long, in reality, people will likely make different choices. Um, so, you know, in order to in order in order to figure that out, we'd have to we'd have to look at what are some of the other options, and you know travel time differences if they were to reroute um, the, the sim traffic model doesn't go to that level of um, sophistication. So, okay, so thank, I, you. thank you very yeah. much. I think that that's sufficient for now, but thank you very much. I was curious about that. Thank you. All right, what I would like to do now is go into public comment and questions. Um, so if you would, those those of you joining us, I see, um, or I saw earlier, Deb Harris with Southside. Um, we potentially, um, Joe Galley with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, maybe some members of Friends of Flagstaff's Future. Saw a few names on there that I recognize. Now is the time. Please put a C or a Q in the chat, and I'll call on you in order. And I know, Anthony, um, I think uh, you are up first. So please go ahead with um, questions and comments. And just be clear, we get one chance here, questions and comments all together, right? Um, the public. I, I think we kind of need to see how this this plays out. I want to be respectful of time, make sure we hear from everybody. Um, but of course, you know, if there's a question or a follow up, 
um, you know, I want to give, I want to give you the opportunity to do so. Okay, because I, I have a few things written down. I just didn't know how to approach them. I'll go through and hopefully I could get everything in. I, I have a fundamental fu being in the true, true sense of the word problem with the a lot of the assumptions being made that lead to the rest of this analysis that's really it's kind of cool to look at this attempt to do math on on something it's not physics though right it's this is social science and so one of one of my main concerns and i'll i'll get to framing this sort of as a comment it's a bit of an or a question it's a bit of an open-ended question but the fundamental assumptions about how people are going to behave and and i think you know david brought up a a, a, a small piece of a hundred versions of a question you could ask, which is, so when you readjusted for making a few other new assumptions about who was going to keep using San Francisco and Bieber, the fundamental assumptions drive the rest of all the analyses that went into the decisions about how much traffic there would be, delay there would be if you have one left-hand turn lane instead of two, right? So, but it, it it's you know garbage in garbage out if if those assumptions are flawed and i think they are because this this traffic this intersection by me you know i'm repeatedly going over how would i use this if i was driving here to here there to there riding my bike here to here there to there uh, it's not as important of an intersection as something like um fourth street or some of these other intersections it doesn't go anywhere northbound really it sort of puts you in no man's land, for an example. So I don't think it's useless. However, I don't think it's as useful potentially as is being assumed for these analyses about, you know, lag time during peak traffic hours. And I think because of that, the there are alternatives being left out based upon them being not viable from that flaw, the, these fundamentally flawed assumptions about how useful this will be. So I, I would like it, it would be great if we could see an alternative that embraced the idea of reducing all of these intersections by about a lane, you know, single left-hand turn lanes, not six and seven lanes, but four and five lanes, and especially northbound, because I don't, like I said, I don't think this is going to be as useful for vehicular traffic northbound as everybody seems to be so convinced it is, but I think that's a key thing that should be at least presented. I also think there should be a little bit more humility on the assumption, fact that we're functioning under a lot of assumptions about how people are going to behave with this intersection. I don't know that I, I I don't know that that's been thoroughly vetted. I think there's a lot of people who've made a lot of assumptions. I'm sure they're very skilled at making those sort of guesses, but Flagstaff's a really weird town for traffic because of its shape and the train tracks and a million other things. So I I guess my question is, it's a bit open-ended, but am I off or is that a one question? Is that, is this a bit of fuzzy logic, these fundamental assumptions about how this thing is going to be used? I don't know how, how much veracity is is there to these assumptions. Can anybody speak to that? Um, this is Jason. I'll I'll take a first sh shot, and then Scott and Joe. I don't know if you guys want to follow sure. on, but yeah. um, yeah, for this process, you know, we're looking at multiple alternatives, and there's there is so you are correct. There are so many levels we can go back and keep zooming out, if you will, further and further back in the assumptions. For this process, we tried to use the tools that were available to us to address the the concerns and the questions. Um, going back to Metro Plan's model would be another level of design and effort that we were not able to get to this point of information in time. We can make assumptions based on what we've done to this date, doing the traffic impact analysis, doing the model. Uh, we can recognize that some of those cues may be rerouted, um, but our numbers are based on available practical software and data. Um, I did mention, for instance, Dave Wessel brought up a great point that you know, do we change the volumes? No, but we can look at sim traffic. And I, I mentioned that is we are showing less volume going through this intersection. And so that's already sort of a result of the middle level 
um, of what we're looking at. So we try to look at it from a micro. We have multiple layers. We have synchro at the micro level. We have a middle layer, at sim traffic, and then we have a high level, which is Metro Plan's model. Uh, you know, we try to be as engineers open and honest as we can. I'm trying to be as clear as we could with our assumptions. Um, we're looking at multiple issues and stuff, and, and we try to bring as good data as we can. And a lot of it is, you are correct, empirical data. This data is backed up by, you know, historical knowledge, engineering judgment, what we've done in other cities and other projects. Um, you know, are there more ways we can continue to analyze this and continue to back out? Yes. Would the results be all that different? I, I'm not 100% certain. What, will they change? Yes, but to what extent? I don't know. Um, Scott, I don't know if you want to jump in more on the model. You've been a little bit more in depth into it. I don't know if you have more on how sim traffic or Metro plans model might change to address sure. that specific question. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with the sentiment, um, Anthony. Um, traffic is a gray science. Um, it's certainly not black and white. Um, you do. Uh, there are there are a lot of a lot of assumptions on on travel behavior um, and and traffic is one of those things where it's a at one level it's a it's a personal choice um, but I guess to kind of go back and you know echo some of what Jason was saying um, a lot of this you know starts at a, a macro scale with the with the regional model um, regional model is looking at land use is looking at trip generation um, mode choices you know whether people decide to ride their bike take transit um, use personal vehicles um, and then and then routing decisions and and, and all that's calibrated um, to existing conditions and so the, the model is set up so that it mimics what we can measure out there today and then it's set up to project um, you know in, into the future and those projections are, are based on land use and and national um national guidance uh in, in you know in terms of routing decisions um it is at an individual level it is a personal choice um and, and that's where the you know behavior aspect comes in and kind of the i'll call it fuzzy logic but the kind of the the gray part of the science um but it is it, it is ca capacity constrained and so a lot of issues with traffic, um, you you can kind of associate it with water. You know, if 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 we tighten the capacity in one spot, it's got to go somewhere else, and it it will reroute. But because of the network in in Flagstaff, I mean, we we do have you know Flagstaff doesn't have the great arterial grid. Um, we do have. We do have constraints. Um, we've got the railroad. Um, you've got very few uh, traffic interchanges with I-40 in the area, um, so that limits some of the routing options. And then, and you know, Milton's a uh, Milton and US-66 is kind of the backbone, and um, it's constrained as well. So, I mean, I think all those decisions have been have been incorporated into these numbers. Um, and and we've gone from the regional model calibrating that projecting out land uses into you know in, in into what we're we're seeing here for lone tree and 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 now we're to the point of okay given all those assumptions and all that analysis what are the best options for this lone tree intersection so okay i appreciate those answers and i'm i i have um two comments then one based on that that answer and then another one that's really a little bit more specific so uh, there are some a lot of assumptions being made and the presentations although incredibly well done and i do appreciate everybody's work it's really nice to see these things visualized and everybody's been very clear and i think thorough but the the assumptions really seem to guide a a um, and in this this fundamental issue, this this uh, fundamental flaw with so much planning, which is that, well, there's going to be a lot of cars, so we got to address a lot of cars, and then we'll try to squeeze some bikes and pedestrians in around them. And so my my one comment 
to the commissions and the committees and any council members listening is that, and we've asked for this before, I, we would love to at least, at least bare minimum, have alternatives that said, if we we're designing this intersection for multimodal first, for bike ped, uh, buses, whatever made sense, and then getting the cars to squeeze in around them. How would this look? And I, I'm still not seeing anything like that. And then that segues pretty well into my specific comment, which is in the, uh, I forget what you're calling it, like the full build out, the really mostly featured version of these. The, these separated bicycle facilities are exceptionally clunky. It's It's like a Alice in Wonderland maze trying to negotiate your bike through these intersections, you know, and ultimately it's safe, but it, it would also be safe if I waited till midnight and there were no cars and I got through the intersection. Like there needs to be an, a, a, a mod modicum of, um, of con consolation to bikes being able to not only get through these intersections safely, but quickly and efficiently. You know, the one that you've just brought up on screen here, personally, as a confident rider, if I was proceeding, for example, west east, I'm staying in that lane. I'm not going off on this side, this off ramp across a, a pedestrian crossing, then across this uh, not slip lane, whatever you're calling it, um, and then across onto an island also with pedestrians, then across another pedestrian crosswalk and across, I mean, that's not only am I changing direction innumerable times, but I'm changing grade and surfaces. So wet or icy, slippery conditions, it gets really weird and unpredictable. This stuff needs to be clear to cyclists how to negotiate it in an efficient, reasonably efficient way. Some of this stuff I, I get, it's great if you want to send a kid through on a bike through these intersections and who's six and try to keep them safe. But for anybody who's got any level of confidence in traffic, they're going to ignore all of this pretty green and red paint and stay in the lane. And, and because you haven't made concessions to bikes to use the traffic lanes, you create angry drivers who are like, there's all that green paint over there. What are you doing in my lane? And, and you further compound bicycle driver conflict. So th that's missing from some of these designs is how, how do you efficiently integrate more confident riders and in, um, in uh, with vehicle traffic? Some of the designs have the bike lane the whole way through and I get that, but then they, there's other concessions being made. So there may or may not be trade-offs, but yeah. Anyway, to summarize two, two main points, I think there's too much here. I think these lanes are too big. There's too many lanes for cars. I don't think it's really necessary. I don't think it will turn out that this particular overpass and some of these intersections are as useful to drivers as is being predicted. I, that's my take on that piece. And secondarily, well, probably primarily for me, these designs do need to account for efficiency for bicyclists better than they currently are. Thanks for the opportunity to comment. Appreciate it. Next, I have uh, Joe Galley. Thanks, Madam Chair. Joe Galley, 101 West Route 66, uh, Senior Advisor for Public Policy at the Greater Flagstaff Chamber of Commerce. I've been doing this job on and off since uh, 2005. <laughs> so I've seen a number of uh, major intersection improvement, uh, including the uh, 4th Street overpass built. I remember when 4th Street sort of dead, dead ended over there behind the Horizon Moving Building and uh, the community came together and 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 put together a, a tremendous uh, road surface infrastructure project and then expanded on it recently when we widened 4th street over uh, i-40 which was really you know if you think about it, it wasn't even on adot's 20-year plan a while ago but due to some leadership at city hall and some initiative on a number of folks uh, at the city we ended up with a great uh, improvement project there that enhances surface transportation. And I think that's what we're looking at here. I'm going to reserve specific comment because I'm not really a, a transportation expert or a traffic expert on intersections and overpasses, but I do want to say I thought it was a very interesting presentation and, and the staff that you've
uh, working on this, the folks be on the team that have uh, made the presentation today did an excellent job. And I think the community really benefits in the long run here uh, when we get this installed uh, to some degree or another. I think the presentation gives uh, the chamber an opportunity to go out to our business members and ask uh, via a survey, and this is our intention, uh, what uh, we think uh, or how we think we should move forward with this. There's a number of questions as it relates to sustainability and greenhouse gas emissions and uh, of course traffic and car traffic, vehicle miles traveled, VMTs and so forth. And I think what I'll do is reserve comment on the options that were discussed today and come back to you after we've surveyed our membership on some of those key points and see what the business community membership has to say about that. I don't have any particular questions for the staff or presenters today, but I did wanna say, I think generally speaking, uh, the entire project seems to be headed in a very good direction. We ought to clean up some of the controversial items, get them behind us and, and get the project done so we can have surface transmit, transfer, uh, excuse me, surface transportation enhanced in this community, which we desperately need. I can tell you that a survey that uh, was done a couple of years ago that we're privy to uh, had transportation uh, as the number one issue in the community. And I think uh, what we've felt at the business community for a number of years is that we've really sort of, as has Arizona, I mean, Elliot Pollack will tell you this, renowned economist and presenter from uh, Arizona State University, he actually spoke at a transportation conference that the chamber held in 2007 here at Little America and said that historically we've underplanned and underfunded transportation in Arizona globally. And that's why we see a lot of the transportation challenges we do all over the state. This is a micro example of that. And uh, hopefully we can get this project funded and done and behind us so that we can enhance surface transportation in our community. Thank you for the time, appreciate it. And again, appreciate the presenters today. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right, I have uh, Paul Beyer. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you, I wasn't expecting to be on so fast. Um, yeah, I just, first I wanna, there was a lot of information there and I do wanna thank the presenters for uh, their detailed um, uh, presentation, presenting their uh, assumptions and all that good stuff. I'm gonna need a lot of time to just digest this. Um, one thing I'm curious about, I live in Brannon Homes um, and I sort of uh, would like to see some analysis of the impact on neighborhoods, especially with respect to how this design is going to drive the design of a lone tree south to Interstate 40, which was also approved by the voters at the same time this uh, overpass was approved. I, I fear that uh, right now, Lone Tree is a pleasant little boulevard. I can hop across it on my bike or as a pedestrian. I fear that uh, once this is built, there's going to be this wall of traffic and traffic noise that's going to make me feel I'm cut off here in the lower south side from Upper South Side from NAU from uh, downtown. Um, so is I, I'd love to see that analysis. I think it's not correct to just um, analyze this as if it's just the overpass without realizing, um, as I, I said in a comment to City Council, it's it's the tail that wags the dog. You know, there's two miles of Lone Tree that's going to run to I-40. So I would like to see some analysis on the impact on the neighborhood of this um, wall of traffic that's likely to be there. Um, I guess that's that's my first request. I have some detail stuff, but I, th I think I'll let it let it pass. And, and first, even does your do your projections include um, in terms of traffic volume, the idea that eventually there's going to be folks who are going to be getting off I-40 because they want to avoid the nightmare of Butler. And now we've created the new nightmare of Butler on the two miles of Lone Tree. Um, thank you. And um, for the team, Brandon Homes area is um, south of, of Sawmill off of Lone Tree Road. Um, so I think maybe you know, if, if Dave Wessel's still online or Jeff Bauman, in addition to Scott or Jason, you know, maybe you can provide a, a brief response to, to Paul's question about the modeling of Lone Tree. Yeah, I, I can. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, Madam Chair, this is David Wessel. Um, the short answer is yes, the uh, modeling of Lone Tree Corridor all the way south to John Wesley Powell was included. <clears throat> Uh, as Jason mentioned at the start of his presentation, if projects were funded, they were included in those 2040 models. So Proposition 419 uh, funded the improvements to Lone Tree Road and it funded the improvements to uh, John Wesley Powell between Lake Mary Road and I-17. So to... Um, the speaker's comment, will people be getting off um, uh, to avoid Butler? Uh, yes, there will be an opportunity to use John Wesley Powell to Lone Tree to come into town. Um, that same model looks at future growth in the John Wesley Powell corridor and makes some assumptions about the growth there, which will put future traffic, increased traffic on Lone Tree. Uh, as as we see growth in uh, the area west or excuse me east of the community college so i'll stop there and see if the uh, rest of the team the wsp team wants to add anything um no dave i think you covered it very well so i don't think we have anything else to add appreciate you jumping in and taking that one so our next um, public comment is michelle james and then Michelle, it'll be Deb Harris. So go ahead, Michelle. Welcome. Hello, um, I'm Michelle James. I'm the executive director of Friends of Flagstaff's Future. Um, as Paul just said, this is a lot of information and I'm still um, I'm reviewing it and coming to uh, to try to understand it better. But here, here's what I'm thinking right now. Um, I'd like to echo Anthony's comment about the veracity of the assumptions and I think we um, absolutely must see an alternative that looks at the intersection of Butler and Lone Tree over, overpass with a reduced number of lanes so that the crossing is safer for bikes and peds. I'm still seeing, um, you know, 26, 27 total lanes. It still seems like a, a nightmare for bikes and pedestrians. Um, also, I, I think there is an assumption being made, and I'm not sure about this. This is half question, I guess that an increase in population in Flagstaff equals an increase in number of vehicles that are being driven. And I don't see how um, how that assumption can be made if you are utilizing the active transportation master plan um, as a, uh, a solid assumption that those um, those actions would be, that are outlined in that plan would be actually be implemented. Um, and you haven't convinced me that this is this doesn't increase the overall vehicle miles traveled in Flagstaff, and I don't understand how it can possibly conform to the intent um, of the carbon neutrality plan. Um, thirdly, I'd like to say, uh, where is the analysis of safety for bikes and pedestrians? I think this is absolutely needed. You have you've talked about maybe doing some safety analysis for vehicles. I think that is important, but I'd also like to see this analyzed by someone who who can who can talk about what types of accidents might occur. How safe are these crossings um, for bicycles and pedestrians? And finally, um, I'll say again, as I have said to council for um, uh, a long time now, many about a month, that further discussion is needed, and I suggest that the process of determining what the best design is for the Lone Tree Overpass intersections um, slow down so that it can allow more public review and input. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Deb Harris, you are next. OK, <clears throat> thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. My computer's been going in and out, so hopefully you, I won't lose you. Wow, a lot of information. And I have to admit, I'm not ashamed. I am totally overwhelmed. So I will be going through the presentation again. I'm sure it's gonna be out there on a website somewhere. So I'll continue to go through it. Just a few things to think about. <clears throat> First of all, um, and I'm not ashamed to say this, at 67 years old, I'm never ever gonna get on a bike on Butler or Long Trees. So that's not gonna happen. But what we haven't talked about is we haven't talked about increasing transfer, uh, increasing public transportation. 
So, you know, I think that pub more public transportation and better transportation would help a little bit. It's not going to help a lot, but it would help a little bit. My next concern is that um, I live in Flagstaff, and so I know how to get around the city. So I cut through Southside when things are crazy on Butler. I cut through, you know, when things are crazy on Milton. I know, and so that's what's going to happen. I can see lots and lots of people coming through Southside, okay, on all those little side streets, because we can come out on Beaver, we can come out on San Francisco or whatever, and so that's going to increase. I'm not so much worried about tourists getting off and going through the neighborhoods, but it's those of us who live here and we know how to get through. So that's something that we really need to talk about and think about. Um, I'm agreeing with everyone in terms of, I think we need to slow this down a little bit and talk about it some more. Um, that might not be a popular thought, but I think that this is too important. And then my final comment is that, and nobody wants to hear this, but I say it anyway. <clears throat> Consistently, historically, we have always done things in neighborhoods of color without giving it the proper thought. And so we're doing that again with this long tree overpass. It's going to happen, but we need to give it a lot more thought. And we need to talk about how it's going to impact Southside. And we need to be realistic about that. So thank you for allowing me the time. Welcome, Deb. I have a follow up question for you. Um, when you talk about the proper thought and the impact to Southside, are you speaking to the um, the architectural component, the colors, how it works with what's under um, the underpass, some of the remnant parcels? Is that really it? Right Is now, that right now, that's not my concern. OK, right now, that's not my concern. My concern right now at this point in time, before we even get to the design of building it, is um, when we do start to build it, how is it going to impact the neighborhood in terms of bringing traffic off of those streets, local traffic off of those streets into the neighborhoods to get wherever it is that they're going? OK, thank you. OK. Um, any other members of the public that would like to address commission committee members? All right. So what I would like to do, it is 638. Um, I would like to take a six minute recess. <laughs> we could just be back at 645. And um, so I'm going to close out public comment at this time. And so when we come back 645, um, what I'm going to be asking of uh, Transportation Commission and our committee members is a recommendation or specific um, specific comments related to the intersection layouts that were presented here based on everything you've seen and what you've heard. So that's going to be my ask when we return and I'm, I'm eager to hear your thoughts about that. So short recess, be back in six minutes at 645 and um, I'm going to leave my camera on and so you can see when I've returned and I'm ready to start.
All right, it's 645. Um, Commissioner Kuhn, are you back? Yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Morley. Present. All right. Commissioner Kraft. Um, I got a, an email from Commissioner Kraft. He's connected. Um, he's just engaged in something at the moment. All right. Can we go ahead and continue? All right. Um, so I look to um, Christine and Jeff to also help facilitate this discussion that we're going to have with our commissioners and committee members. Um, so I would ask that um, commissioners and committee members let me know when you when you're ready for for comment. Put a C or a Q in the chat, and we can get started. I think we'll um, looks like we might start with the uh, chair of the BAC, Susan Heffel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, well, I have a, a number of comments, and but mainly uh, it's stepping back a few paces from the details of the intersection plan, um, uh, and just. To tie into the last comment, Lone Tree currently is not a friendly place to ride your bike, uh, especially as you crest the hill. I know that that is going to be uh, get some changes, but uh, if we're bringing more traffic, we better make it way more uh, friendly for bicycles and peds right now because it is not. Um, but Mainly, um, I'd like to tie this into Flagstaff's uh, climate emergency declaration and our carbon neutrality goals. This whole project seems to fly in the face of those goals to me. We were supposed to tie our development to uh, 2019 traffic levels, and this is not doing that. This is this is uh, just one more thing. You know, build it, and they will come. We'll have more cars. Uh, if we're not convinced that climate change is relevant to us, we only have to look at the communities in Boulder County that were burned to the ground uh, two weeks ago. Flagstaff is in just as precarious a position with uh, fire, and we must dedicate ourselves to uh, the carbon neutrality goals and our active transportation master plan. Um, if this project were to go forward at all, personally, I would want to see it as dedicated only to bikes, peds, and buses or mass transit as uh, a major uh, bridge program pro project in Portland, Oregon was designed. It's this kind of uh, push and pull. We can pull people out of their cars by not making it more comfortable for them to continue sitting in them. And we can pull them onto bike and ped trails and, and uh, mass transit if we build much more infrastructure for bikes, peds, and mass transit. And this is where I think we should be focusing our efforts, not in building yet another massive project. If it has to go through, it should be downscaled. It should be committed for bikes, peds, and mass transit. And uh, if you build uh, the systems for the bikes and the peds and the, and the bussers, they will come as well. And that's what our goal should be. Um, and not just uh, continuing to answer to car traffic. This, this project is overbuilt. It, it seems really inconvenient. As a cyclist myself, I don't know how I would get through that intersection. It, it looks pretty chaotic. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And so if I'm hearing you correctly, Susan, there isn't any alternative that you've seen here that's acceptable to you. No, no. I, like I said, I would rather see one that just caters to 
uh, the forward thinking transportation, not the backward thinking transportation. All right, Commissioner Kuhn. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, you know, I, I would like a uh, analysis on what would they think was the uh, safest intersection that they they design, including cars, obviously pedestrians and bicycles. Let the you know the engineers or the professionals let them tell us what is the safest, so that when they come back, um, and and analyze it that way. We're, we we have too many cars now in Lone Tree. My public, my phone is public with the job I have. It's amazing how many times I get called now when when cars get backed up a mile and a half on Lone Tree because of Kinsey. So we have to do something to get this out, get us out of this. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm wondering if um, we can have a discussion about safety. And um, going back to that, uh, the matrix that was presented towards the very end of the presentation. And I'd like to hear how, um, how it might be possible to address um, the safety requests from Commissioner Kuhn as well as the comment from um, Dave Wessel into what we see here in this intersection summary. Yeah, Joe, I'm gonna defer to you on this one. I think the request, and please correct me, uh, Madam Chair, if I'm misinterpreting is one, how will we approach it, time frame potentially, and then do you want an initial engineering judgment on what the different safety parameters would be at this time or? I would, I would, because I, I look at the, the intersection summary and I see, um, you know, five being great, four being good, and I'm, I'm looking at full build out and single left turn lanes as um, the protected separated bike facilities. Um, and so when I see a protected separated bike facility, I think safety. So I, um, I'd like to hear, you know, your engineering judgment in, in response to that. So Joe, and could you answer? Oh, sorry. Joe, well, you uh, can address what our time frame would be of doing that analysis and then some initial engineering judgment on those four intersections. Uh, I guess time frame uh, for doing that analysis, uh, I guess we'd have to look at the different uh, features of those protected bike lanes. Uh, seems like we the I think of a, a time frame right now, a uh, few weeks. Okay. We can talk off like that. Needed. Is the data available to address the bikes, the peds, and the vehicles? Is Are there studies and data available for that? Uh, I'd have to look into that. I know we looked uh, really close at those channelized right turns, and uh, there's really one leading document that uh, uh, goes into the detail of making those channelized right turns uh, pedestrian friendly. And uh, there was limited data on the, the safety features and uh, that document uh, didn't provide a recommendation uh, for the, the uh, type of control to get to the, the across the, the right turn lane that was left more towards a particular intersection or project and uh, what might be best for for that a particular project location, so uh, that would take a little bit of time to, to look into that too. I know there's a highway safety manual that has different ways of uh, reviewing uh, safety aspects. Uh, there's different features that we could look for. Uh, something that's called crash modification factors that would show uh, a particular design has uh, ways of reducing crashes or uh, riding added safety. So there there are things we can look into. Uh, it, yeah, Jason, we'll have to talk about this offline in terms of the scope of it, because, I, you know, a lot of what Joe just mentioned is, 
you know, crash reductions from an existing intersection and, and doing improvements because all of these options and alternatives are a future intersection that at, at, at this scale doesn't exist today. It would all be, it would all be predictive analysis, um, making, you know, making various assumptions. And so we would, we'd be comparing all four across the board, um, you know, on a, on a future projected, um, you know, level of safety. Okay, understood. Any preliminary thoughts on the different safety values of these four options? Either of you, just to address Madam Chair's question. I think there's uh, safety benefits for uh, the channelized uh, right turn in terms of uh, minimizing the crossing. Uh, I think some of the, I guess, uh, give an opinion of uh, complication for the bikes is that we are in some of those options moving the bike uh, bikes lanes off of uh, Butler since uh, that was back a ways. Uh, one thing we'd heard that uh, there, there's, per, there's concerns for cyclists on the roadway. Uh, so that kind of uh, pointed us in the direction of a completely protected intersection where uh, bikes are in those protected crosswalks and crossing at, uh, with uh, protected signalization. Uh, uh, the comment for having the, the bike box in front of uh, the stop car is definitely something we could look into to provide a little bit clearer location for cyclists to stage uh, to make particularly the left turns. Uh, there are still some uh, safety benefits for uh, the channelized right turn island, as well as potentially uh, looking at the cyclists when they're in the roadway. So I assume that these intersections weren't just, um, oh, here's an idea, let's try that. That these are based on um, maybe some uh, federal guidelines, some standards, some good practice. Can you speak to um, the design behind or um, some of the resources used to come up with this intersection design? And, and what I'm getting at here related to the safety component is, um, you, you know, you're not putting forward an intersection, I would assume, that has um, serious safety flaws that th that these designs have have been vetted and that that's what I'm trying to get to as well can you can you speak to what standards um, where this has been put into action in other locations and references on that uh, I guess some of the features particularly with the protected intersection uh, stem from the latest uh, by uh, National Association of City Transportation officials NACTO is the acronym. Uh, they have uh, some guidelines for enhanced pedestrian and bike safety at intersections. Uh, they have a particular uh, document uh, that relates to uh, uh, the protected intersection, uh, the signalization, the advanced uh, timing uh, for pedestrians to get them out into uh, the intersection. I think we went into some of these details in the mayor and council presentation with uh, some of the diagrams of uh, the corner uh, designs. Yes, uh, yeah, that's that's a document. And uh, in terms of the right turn lane, I'm just trying to grab the, the acronym. Uh, there's a document put out by the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, NCHRP, that is particularly uh, was researched for the design of that right turn channelization and uh, provided uh, geometry guidance, uh, some guidance on the, the traffic control. Uh, there's uh, areas of how you get through that channelization. Uh, and then we've looked uh, uh, other areas that are more progressive towards bike and peds, Portland, Boulder, uh, areas, California, Davis. Uh, so we 
brought elements from the, the latest in intersection design to enhance uh, the safety of peds, uh, pedestrians and bikes at this intersection. That, yeah, and something we presented last time, just to sort of follow up, this is from that NACTO document again, the protect the intersection diagram. So this is a lot of what we're basing our designs on. Um, it, it shows, you know, car relative distance to where the staging area is. Get peds and bikes out in front so you can see that there's somebody waiting to cross, separating cyclists from pedestrians. Yeah, these are all intentional decisions based on the latest research that is out there. Um, having hard data, I think that's where it may not be available. This will reduce X amount of crashes per year. Um, but all of our design decisions have followed these documents, as Joe stated. And you can see a lot of these similar guidelines um, in our concepts. If I go back to a... <clears throat> similar concepts between what you see. Let me pull that back over. With this document and that intersection corner concept here. I mean, that the, that's what our guiding principles are. And NACTO also puts out this uh, guideline urban street design guide. Uh, it's been updated uh, second version, I believe in 2014. So they, they have elements of uh, bike lanes uh, and uh, the multi-use paths and how to uh, address uh, their safety at the corners of the intersection. So uh, for example, on what you see on your screen there highlighted in red, we look to have larger staging areas uh, to, for the pedestrians and cyclists uh, to, to have space at the corner uh, to stage and not feel constrained uh, and to increase their visibility uh, to the cars. And uh, my final question, and then I've got, um, I need to go to the uh, the other commissioners and committee members. Um, but the the document that you had open, the NACTO guidelines, um, or maybe this is a question for uh, Jeff Bauman. Um, was that one of the references used or a resource in the preparation of the active transportation master plan? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is this is Jeff Bowman. Yeah, the concept for all of these intersections, well, actually, yeah, for all four of these scenarios is this protected intersection concept that's coming out of both NACTO and out of the ATMP guidance. So I see a comment in the chat. Maybe we should bring those back up side by side to show that. But yeah, I mean, this the scale of these is a little bit, you know, not as easy to look at as the NACTO guide, but it's this is the concept this is exactly what is trying to be implemented at Lone Tree and Butler is this protected intersection, not a NACTO or the ATMP. Okay. Thank so you. I'm trying to find a good example. Um, so let me find a different that one doesn't. Yeah, so if you look at this intersection corner versus this guide, um, you have the pulled off cyclists, that's what you're seeing with this crossing, the staging area, which is what you're seeing here. Um, a little bit different how the crossings, we don't have a, a vertical change between our bicycle staging and our crossings. So you're seeing a little bit differences. Um, and then you have your rounded curbed corner, which is what you're seeing in this top right. So the stop bar um, is back here. You're putting pedestrians out in front of that vehicle. So they can look to their right of a large staging area. They're not hiding behind equipment and poles. They can see them and as they come around, just like it's shown in this thing, um, highlighted high visibility crosswalks for them to cross for cyclists and pedestrians uh, with plenty of time to see someone in the crosswalk. The crosswalk for pedestrians is a little bit further back just to give a little bit more reaction time if necessary. And that's what we're sort of mimicking. Again, it's concept level. We don't have all the elements in here. But that's more or less what we're pulling in. Thank you for that discussion. Commissioner Morley. Hi, 
Hi, thank you. Um, I have a number of comments here. So um, first, I want to say I really appreciate diving into some new performance measures. Um, so for example, um, PED delay, gallons of gas, greenhouse gas emissions, VMT, I think these are all things that are new to us as a community, and I'm excited to see us start to consider them um, and moving away from traditional things like level of service, which um, I don't think has as much value. Um, I think they'll take us time to perfect how to tr how to do the, all these new performance measures really well, but I'm excited and thankful that you guys are trying to move them forward and have discussions around them. I do think that there are, as others have mentioned, maybe some missing performance measures that are important, um, such as the safety component for some of these other ones. And then I think at our last Transportation Commission meeting, we also talked about some community character uh, performance measures that could be considered, such as noise. And I think that that might get to some of the comments that um, Ms. Harris was talking about. And then I would, in the end, love to see all these things evaluated, you know, in one matrix like you have, where you could uh, um, have some good discussions about the trade-offs. But I think we're headed in a good direction with that. Um, you know, to be, I think the question in front of us is which of these intersections do we like the most? And to be quite frank, I, I don't see huge differences in them. I think that they're all kind of of the same vein with more minor differences. What I read about channelized um, or, uh, or, you know, uh, slip lane intersections is that they're not great for bikes and peds because there's a separate crossing. I think that's also not considered in the actual time to cross um, and so you're actually making people wait twice and extending the length of time to cross. And I think that's the way it's evaluated in here. So I, I guess it's interesting because I kind of start to go back towards the traditional intersection where people have to slow down more at the corner to pause for pedestrians to cross the road. Um, when it comes to uh, bike movements, I definitely have some concerns based on the comments I heard tonight, um, like the left turn movement across the lane sounded very challenging. And again, I, as a bike rider, I know that I find the slip lanes challenging when you wanna go straight and cars wanna keep zooming to the right. Um, so I guess, again, that kind of pushes me back towards that traditional uh, intersection. I do think though, I wish there was a little bit more diversity in some of the intersections we were seeing, but, you know, specifically thinking about the character, which I think is one of the big pieces that we're missing. We keep showing this compared to the 66 uh, and 4th Street intersection, which is very much a commercial area. I think the character here is quite different from that. I think that there's actually quite a bit of housing density here. It might not be single family, but there is quite a bit of housing density in the sawmill area. There's more proposed in that area. And I think it's something that could really be this vibrant mixed use part of town. Um, and so I guess I'm concerned about the character of this and the ability or desire for people to wanna cross between these four corners that in some years could actually be quite um, vibrant and active. So I would love to see, and maybe it fails when it goes through the evaluation criteria, but something like a five, like five lanes on each side or um, the traditional intersection with the single left. Um, but really, I think, you know, like something that was more of a traditional or maybe it's historic, I don't know, when we didn't build such big intersections with, you know, two travel lanes and one turn lane, be it left or right uh, in each direction and then two receiving lanes, that kind of thing. Um, so, but ultimately I would say like the details of that, I'd really ask that you guys, you know, just work with Martin and the experts in this field. I do think that there are standards out there that are best practices when it comes to the details about raised intersections and bike boxes being in front. Um, I think bigger picture, I do have one concern about um, the, the level of buy-in from the community. And it goes back to that this is a voter initiative and I really believe it needs to be built to be all modes, um, cars included. Uh, because that's what the voters asked for. But I do worry that if we don't have good buy-in from the community, it will impact the community's ability or support for future initiatives when we come back and say we want to do something else if they feel, in a sense, like burned on having trusted that they would like the design and then not having liked it come out in the end. So I guess I would echo the comments in the end about I think maybe we need a little bit more input from the public maybe some more public outreach, give them some additional opportunities. And um, because I think there's this bigger issue about making sure that the community is behind what um, the ultimate design is. So um, that's, those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have committee member Jody Norris. And my comment has already been made uh, by some of the other people speaking. So I will yield my time to the next person. 
Okay. And I believe, um, Jody, you had you had listed types and things because you had to leave in the the comments. Yes, and then I was able to come back, and you're still meeting. So I don't know. If, I'm assuming that probably already was read by folks in the chat. I have not read that yet because I was oh. just going around. And yeah, I yeah, no, that's fine. Up, so now would be the time. All right. Well, I will read it. Um, it's good. I've got it written out. So. Um, I'm uh, part of the pedestrian advisory committee and was previously part of the bicycle advisory committee. Um, I'm a frequent pedestrian and year round bicycle commuter for 13 years in Flagstaff. I've always been struggling to find a comfortable commuting route to work. Um, I would say that personally I'd be okay with the intersection being larger if we could remove the alternatives for vehicles turning across any active pedestrian crosswalk. Um, that means having right turns on an arrow rather than right turning, being able to go across the crosswalk. There is a place in the traffic cycle for that to occur, and it, but it would require sensors to detect the cars waiting both to turn left or right, because if you're turning right, you actually require um, a signal for it. I just feel like it would be lovely to have one intersection in town with this as a configuration where crosswalks are never legal to turn across because that has just been a constant problem for me. Um, and it already seemed like a minimum necessity based on what the expected ped usage of this intersection would be according to, I put a link in the chat, um, the federal highway fhwa.dot.dot.dot.gov. And the second one um, was just a request that someone there review the speeds used for pedestrian crossings because in looking at a couple of the federal documents um, it says that those shouldn't be used if the intersections need to be made available for slower groups like people with disabilities the elderly and people with children um, and I think that those people, even though they're not a large proportion of the users, having been around there during my commutes, they are routinely going there. And so the federal guidance would seem to suggest that we should go with slower speeds for our pedestrian signals. And there are some tables in there of estimated speeds for those groups. And again, to me, calling a intersection protected if people are able to turn across an active crosswalk just doesn't really work for me as a definition, but I do appreciate that this may be the best intersection in town uh, that we will have. However you guys are doing it, it's wonderful the work you're doing, other than if we can get a grade separated one, which of course I would love. Thank you much. Great. Thank you, Jody. Uh, committee member Kim Austin. Go ahead, Kim. Thank you, Madam Chair. I. First of all, there was so much work put into this presentation and I'm I'm very impressed. Um, so with that being said, I'm a concerned about the traffic on Lone Tree. I will agree because I think there's a there's a time lapse between projects and and that might be something that is um, very difficult to manage. Um, I am concerned with the safety of the intersections. I like Kate's. I agree with Kate in that. I don't know. I tend to go back to the traditional, like she said, if there were some enhancements, you know, for bike and ped, if I have to pick one, but I don't, I don't know if I want to pick one right now because I'm looking at the eyes of a child and I would hope that there are more children that are out riding. Um, and I'm just not sure that they could navigate this kind of an intersection. You know what I mean? And so I'm just, I'm a little concerned about that. And then my last thing is whatever we decide, we just need to make sure we educate, educate, educate so that everybody knows, you know, how to navigate and, and um, the intersections. Do you need, uh, Madam Chair, like a decision today? That's, that's another thing I was wondering. What we need is um, a recommendation or comments from the commission, the committee members to take forward to city council on January 25th at their work session for this. And so those and I'm trying what I'm really looking for, and I think the team is looking for are very specific comments. So, you know, 
um, go back, try harder, do something different. Um, those are, aren't quite as helpful as something that's very specific. Like I support, for example, um, you know, I, I, I think it's acceptable to have a single turn lane and have backups that extend that far back, for example. The, those are the types of things, you know, it, it's difficult to say, yeah, I pick intersection B. I, I, I totally get that. But maybe that maybe there is a, you know, somebody out there, a commissioner, committee member that that sees it and is like, yeah, yep, I'm I'm behind that. Um, but th that's really what what we would like to receive and what I need to hear from from the group this evening. Is is what are what are the main talking points? What are what is the main message to council? And it needs to be specific, so that we can With move that forward. And and whatever that looks like, moving forward, whatever that looks like. But we need to move forward. Yes, I I, I totally figured that we can't. We need to do something. Um, there's a timeline. Okay, so my comment, and I'm hopefully this is helpful to you, is I would like to see a more traditional type with maybe some bike boxes or raised um, crossings or, you know what I mean? Put the stop bar ahead of the cars, maybe even a signalized light that lets the bikes enter the intersection three seconds before the cars, those kinds of things in a more simple, way so that the average person can navigate. I'm not necessarily thinking we need to expand and make this massive intersection though. OK, I'm done. No, I, I appreciate that um, that comment, Kim. And um, I know that you've been working for a long time on the active transportation master plan. Um, and that's something that you've had so many meetings about and so many discussions about. And so I know that your comments are coming from a lot of those those discussions that you've had where how do we deal with these um, these types of projects where some of it's infill, you know, it's reconfiguring an intersection. Granted, there's a leg that's being added to the north, but we already have the south leg. We already have the east and the west leg. It exists today. Um, and what are things that we can do to improve those inter intersections? Um, so I appreciate the the specificity in your in your comments. Thank you. Um, all right, I have Sustainability Commissioner John Daly. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, so just a, a couple of thoughts. It's in terms of very specific feedback. Um, I think the traditional intersection, uh, you know, maybe with a yeah, I, I see the there's a variant for single left turn lanes, but. Um, I don't see a variant on the traditional that that goes that way, and that that might be appealing. But you know, overall, I mean, I think the, the four the four options presented, you know, going back to the kind of discussion of the character, like uh, you know, I was down in Phoenix last week, and this is a, like these are Scottsdale scale intersections, right? They uh, the perfectly at home, and you know, the land of uh, of strip malls where people drive everywhere because it's 120 degrees. But that that's not what this part of town is going to look like in even 10 years. Um, you know, we've all seen the massive development or redevelopment of the area the last 10 years have brought, uh, you know, high density housing, walkable commercial and, uh, you know, washable, walkable commercial establishments. These are going to be highly trafficked uh, areas. So, you know, we, we can't think of it like we do today, but, uh, you know, people are mostly going to drive through there and, you know, there's not going to be, uh, potentially thousands of new people that want to walk downtown or want to bike downtown. Uh, or, you know, this might in 20 or 30 years, this is downtown. So, you know, is, is this the kind of thing that we want in the middle of our downtown area in 30 years? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. So, you know, I think, uh, uh, I think that's the lens we should be looking at this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Morley, I want to go back to one of your comments about uh, public outreach. So um, to date, I know that we've had, um, this is our second commission meeting. I believe they've gone to a couple of other commissions. There was a public meeting. This is coming off the heels of about a eight year long project that culminated in 
Proposition 419 and 420. Um, what can you give me some specifics on what you would want to see for um, or, or what's missing in that in that process? Because I uh, honestly, I mean, I feel like there has been quite a bit of of public engagement in this process. Um, but that's that's my perspective. So I'd, I'd love to hear from you about like what you're thinking is has been missed or would be the next step in that engagement process. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. I think um, and I haven't I don't know all the public outreach, so I will admit that from the get go. But I think based on some of the comments we heard tonight, just not I guess I generally don't feel like there's a bunch of there's a big community buy into the project and it's very controversial and I think it is one of the most important infrastructure projects that we've done in a long time and I'd love to find a way to get the community behind it before we proceed um, and so but I think of most importance would be the south side community and then all the communities that are developing in the sawmill area so I don't know if there's been targeted meetings for those groups. I know getting people to attend public outreach meetings is really hard. Um, so I'm not, you know, I don't know what the best practice for that would be. But I, I guess I just don't, I'd love to have the community behind this project 100%. And it, it feels like there's maybe more negativity around it now than positive comment. And I'd love to see that flipped before we um, keep moving forward. So. Oh, absolutely. And um. Commissioner Morley, I, I agree with you, and I think that's what, what's been very challenging here because as commissioners, um, you know, we were, we made a recommendation of 419 and 420, and we supported it, and we supported what was presented, and then it was presented in a specific way to voters, and it, and both of those passed, and, it, and 420 specifically passed, and what, and that was specific to the Lone Tree Overpass, and, and how it was how it was presented to the community. And, um, you know, I, I, I went back to that as, as part of my research and thought process and going into this, and it was presented to the community as bridging the tracks and helping traffic flow better um, by building an overpass um, and then combined with the improvements to 419. So it was part of that congestion relief. And we had, we had community support for that. And I, um, you know, as commissioners, we are the transportation tax oversight. Um, that is one of our roles as commissioners. And this is a this is a transportation tax project. It's a combination of 419 and 420. Um, what I what I wanted to say about Proposition 420 is that um, that was, you know, the overpass was separate from the transportation tax. So this was standalone. It so the the community support on that um, wasn't skewed because it was packaged with other things. Um, and so I I faced the same challenge that you're facing, and that I'm I'm hearing a lot of negativity or consternation about it. Yet I go back to how it was presented, and, and we have a majority of voters. And I also look back to you know, a community survey that was normalized and conducted in 2021 that was presented to council about community priorities and transportation with, um, you know, the automobile still being the priority mode of transportation, which is indicated in this, you know, in what we're seeing today and, um, you know, the, the number of vehicles that are using um, this infrastructure. So, Anyway, I know that was that was a lot, but um, you know, I, I really appreciate your comments, and and that's kind of the the conversation I wanted to have about how how can we arrive at something that is that is going to be acceptable. Maybe it's not perfect for for everyone in every mode of travel, but it's hey, we've done a really good job with trying to take an infill project where we have a lot of constraints all the way around this. We already have, have demand on Butler. We already have demand on Lone Tree, and how can we improve safety by making a connection to 66 and improve efficiency and safety for, for that entire intersection? Because we just have competing uses and needs. It's, it's hard to balance those things. Yeah, I appreciate everything you said, and I hope my comments were clear that I think this is an important project that we need to deliver. Um, I 
I wonder if part of that community conversation could be having that wider variety of design and then let it that we're hearing about tonight and then having the evaluation matrix that at least shows we looked at it and then making you know a conscious decision off of it where I feel like people don't aren't even satisfied with maybe the the different design options that have been proposed or that they're not different enough and then ultimately maybe we end up right back where we are once we see how they all come through an evaluation matrix and how the others compare but i, I wonder if part of it is that they haven't that the community hasn't been able to see the alternatives and what the pros and cons of it are not saying i'm right just brainstorming out loud with you right now. <laughs> I appreciate that. We're brainstorming with 50 other people on the line. Uh, <laughs> um, other other commissioners. Um, that was a lot that, that Commissioner Morley and I just talked about. I would like to hear your thoughts and committee members on, on that conversation. Oh, wow. Uh, Commissioner Kraft. Hi, I um, I just wanted to share that I have not heard the community being negative about this. Um, I'm hearing about it now, but um, <clears throat> meaning people I talk to about this um, and have been talking about this project for how long has it been? Has it been two years or something since the it was traffic? 2019 was um, propositions 419 and 420. And so, I mean, a lot of people are excited about this option, particularly once it is joined to um, JW Powell to create another way around Milton. So just, just to put that out, that it, I don't see it as as that there's this overwhelming negative i think the we're hearing about people who have concerns about it now but um the people who voted for it were excited about it and the people i've talked to about it are so excited about it um i also wouldn't mind hearing from uh jeff or somebody in the city because i'm curious you know like this was already sort of decided upon, put before the voters, and it passed. So how much leeway is there to change the original plan once it's been voted in? Um, how, do, how do these projects work? Um, if somebody could address that, I would be happy. Anyone? Yeah, I'll say Jeff or Christina, <laughs> something <laughs> that you can help with. Sure, I wasn't sure who wanted to to take that one. I mean, yeah, yeah. When we educated voters for Proposition 419 and 420, we showed pretty specific things because on this project, we had gone through the two, you know, Lone Tree Corridor study and then Lone Tree Overpass study. So we were pretty, we had pretty good pictures of what we were anticipating, uh, which is generally what's shown on these exhibits, but we, we've added, you know, there wasn't a ton of detail then, we've added a lot of detail. We've added a number of pedestrian bike components to these, um, which is what we've been talking about with the channelized right turns, with um, the protected intersection concept. So I think there's there's flexibility for sure, um, but I don't, I, I don't know that there's a definition of where that flexibility ends, but there is, there's some flexibility for sure. I mean, we're showing it, we're showing it here as we progress through the design. I don't know if that helps answer your question because it's not real clear. I mean, in 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 the past, like in the last period of the sales tax, <clears throat> I mean, have you run into this? It's like, I mean, from my point of view, it's a lot of these things have already been decided by the voters and um we we have the ability to go back and now change that and possibly spend money differently than how it was envisioned i mean is that is that how these projects work or um are there guidelines are there rules or you know what i mean um 
I, I even wondered this back when when they did pass, like what will it end up looking like? Is is it could this be changed? Or is there a certain amount that we have to like we're required by law to stick to certain criteria or something like that? So, so now that you mentioned law, yeah, Rick's gonna help. Uh, now that you mentioned law, I, I'm not an attorney. <laughs> Um, and it, it is a tricky situation. There's all different levels of definition through the voting process. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how far I, maybe I'll let Rick jump in because I've tried once and I, okay. I don't know that I was real clear because I don't know that it is super clear, but let's see what Rick has to say, but this will be good. <laughs> uh... Uh, thanks for your confidence, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, Commissioner Kraft, I think that is a really pertinent question. Um, so let me start with our city council will in fact be seek, will be getting legal advice on that very question. Uh, that advice will be provided in executive session and ultimately our city council will be the ones that decide how to proceed. That being said, I'm hopeful uh, that the, uh, you know, the decision transportation decision 2018 can be balanced with the carbon neutrality plan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, carbon neutrality plan. Uh, we didn't even know about the carbon neutrality plan back in 2018. Um, so again, I just to be redundant, um, I'm hopeful that we can find a way to balance these things now. And ultimately, that'll be up to our city council. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. I mean, to, from what I saw here, there seemed to be clear directions on what was um, going to spend the least amount of gallons as far as I could tell. But um, anyway, that's that was my main um, concern. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. Um, I just want to remind members of the public the chat is not part of um, formal public comment. It's really just to let me know if you've got a question or comment. So um, if you could refrain from using the chat in that way, I would appreciate that. And it allows us to focus on the discussion that we're having here right now. Um, all right, I have a comment request from Commissioner Sustainability Commissioner John Daly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I guess, yeah, kind of circling back to kind of the high level, uh, you know, the voters voted on this and so we have to do it. Um, yeah, I'd just like to point out that, uh, you know, at the time, Prop 420 was clipped. Prop 420 was passed. You know, it passed with 51.41% of the vote. So it passed by about a margin of 700 votes. And that was three years ago. So I think some of the, you know, I guess, uh, as, as, in terms of public opinion, three years is a long time. So I think some of this, uh, this disconnect is that, you know, people, people are more concerned about climate than they were three years ago. Uh, and, you know, there have been uh, you know, several prominent news stories. You know, the, the federal government is trying to hand out money to, to remove urban freeways. Um, so, you know, I think that gives some of us pause. Like, I, I voted for Prop 420 when it came out, but, uh, you know, I, I want to ensure that we're not creating some boondoggle that uh, 20 years from now, uh, we're going to hope that the federal government pays us to tear out um, because, it, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, create takes a massive bite out of the urban core that could otherwise be businesses paying property taxes. So yeah, I think that's kind of where the, you know, in terms of what the public wants, where, you know, a margin of 1%, uh, you know, three years, like I said, three years is a long time. So I think that's where some of this desire to ensure that uh, the project is as, is as good as it could be is coming from. Thank you. Uh, committee member Jody Norris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the specific things are, I'm fine with um, the more lanes. I feel like that's what the voters were going for, but I also understand everybody else's comments. I'm just making my own comments. The simplified version without channels, I feel like I would appreciate 
both as a pedestrian and as a bicycle, especially. Um, so the non channel, I think we saw an example of there where it was um, on one of those particular corners. Um, good luck with this. I personally. I find it very hard, but to me, this process has been going and I think we should. I really think we should take a look at whatever the next projects are down the road and throw ourselves into trying to find the climate friendly solution. But I feel like this project, given its funding, its voter approval, like we have every coming project down the line, I realize we have to draw the line somewhere for carbon neutrality and start making those choices. But I think that came up too late for this project, given what the voters said. And so I, even though I don't like it, particularly I understand that we're a city of lots of people and everybody, we're, we're trying to make the best of this deal that we can. And I did want to just quickly mention at the pedestrian advisory committee, I brought up this beautiful intersection that had two underpasses in Boulder, Colorado. It was absolutely lovely. It would have been perfect here. The only reason why we're not doing it, it sounds like, is because it cost $15 million. And, and so I realized that the voters didn't approve a $15 million intersection here. So as much as I wish that I, you know, that we could do that. Um, I can't declare that on my own. Thank you very much for your time. And just to describe what that intersection was for those who didn't um, weren't part of that advisory committee meeting, uh, it was essentially a think of the intersection as being a deck, an elevated deck, a bridge itself, and then um, all the other movements were underneath. So that that's the intersection that you're referring to, um, I believe. <laughs> Commissioner Morley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I had one more idea going back to one of the early slides in the presentation about um, when you increase VMT somewhere, some of the other things you could do and the conversation about the downtown streets. And I wonder if this becomes a more exciting or palatable project to the community if it's paired with the piece about also redoing the streets downtown. So if we're gonna take a bunch of traffic off those downtown streets, is there opportunity to consider them to be one lane, enhance the ADA and sidewalk accessibility. I think that the there's so many exciting things happening with the outdoor cafes, except then as a person in a wheelchair, I don't know how people are navigating downtown right now, quite honestly. So is there an opportunity to reconsider the downtown streets as part of the design that has this big win um, while some of the other things occur? And I think that the two marrying the two could have some benefit as well, um, because yeah, if there's only a thousand people on San Francisco, uh, what else could we potentially do for the community there? So um, I'd hate to not do them together and then not have some of the reductions that we're anticipating, and then therefore never be able to to make the improvements. Um, but um, I think it would be it would be a real win. So. Thank you, Commissioner Morley. I have a similar dream to you. Um, I also know there's a there is an opportunity below the um, the overpass for a connection there, a local connection that could be bike and ped. And so I envision this corridor that goes east and west. Yeah, the Eldon corridor. They have it depicted here. So I envision this Eldon corridor as being bike and ped and um, enjoyable and. And it all of a sudden it becomes really appealing and that combined with some possible changes to Beaver and San Francisco that instead of trying to to make all of the facilities happen at one location or along one piece, we've got these alternate and, and scalable um, opportunities that that get packaged along um, or become part of a, a plan, a capital program for moving forward. So I share that that same vision for a, a foots connection south of Lone Tree through Sawmill serving campus of what that future could be. Um, all right, so I, I'm going to try to summarize um, a lot of the things that I've heard in an effort to get to talking points with our, our council members. Um, Rick Barrett, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Bef I, you know, I, I, 
I sensed that you were going to jump in and do just what you were going to do. So I thought now was a good time to request that uh, you as the chair ask our commissioners if they are interested in the five lane option or the four lane option that I, I've, I've heard very clearly from the community that uh, you know that is something they'd like to see. It's certainly come out uh, in this discussion and other commission meetings. Um, so I just respectfully ask that uh, you have the commission consider that for us. Thank you for that. Reminder. And thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I apologize. That's twice now. I have not introduced myself. I am the city engineer, Rick Barrett, uh, also engineering director, uh, but been listening intently and thank you for your wonderful work in managing this meeting. Thanks. All right, um, I'm happy to start with with my response. Um, I think it's essential that level of service is met when this project is open, and that gives me quite a bit of concern with how voters, how it was presented to voters um, in 2018 and moving forward, and how it was conceptualized in. 2008 when I attended the first open house about this and the public process through that point. Um, you know, for for those reasons and the, the the big idea that I I talked about just a moment ago about what that Eldon corridor. Um, I'm I'm in favor of of full lane geometry. Um, and, and not having backups that extend and, and potentially impede traffic on um, Route 66, or that begin to block intersections east or west of this intersection, or that people get frustrated and start um, taking bypass down local streets. Um, so that's that's my my personal opinion. I, I'd love to hear from um, the other commissioners on that related to number of lanes. But not all at once. Madam Chairman. Yeah, <laughs> Commissioner Kuhn, go ahead. You know, I'll go back to what is the safest. We're going to have to have all. We're going to have pedestrian. We're going to have to have bikes on there. And we're going to have to have cars. They're going electric. We, we've got ourselves into trouble for not doing anything for 50 years. And, and we can park outside on 17 and bike in and, and completely eliminate cars. It's never going to happen. We're going to need to use what they come back with, what is safest for all three. If it's a four lane, I'm good with that. If it's a five lane attorney, let the engineers and, and they can do some correlation on what is what is going to be the safest for all that. You have the number of NAU students that live over there in Sawmill. They're walking to NAU, which is great. They're bicyclists. That's what we're achieving, but we don't want to make a mess like Kate said, and then have to change it in a few years down the road. Let's see what they recommend on how we can get across this and, and, and let people move to NAU and, and across and, and keep the south side. Thank you, Commissioner. I see uh, your camera on, Commissioner Kraft. Uh, yeah, there. I'm trying to find the slide. There's uh, basically I'm in favor of the full build or the um, the other one that's like a hybrid or what was that called? Does anybody remember that? Balanced. Thank you. So yeah, I don't have a big argument to make. Um, it seems obvious to me. I don't want to I definitely don't want to restrict the lanes um, and then have to work on this overpass again in a short number of years. If we're going to do it, let's do it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Morley. Yeah, I, th I think it's worth doing the evaluation, not determining that's what we're doing at this point, but doing the evaluations so that the community can see that we did it and look at the impacts and pros and cons of all the alternatives. 
Thank you. And um, Susan, final comment? Yes. Well, um, to start with, I wanted to remind everybody uh, that their um, model was uh, set up on the design of the, the, the worst possible scenario during peak travel time. And there's no place in Flagstaff where you're not going to get stuck at a light during the peak of the rush hour. And, and that's just traffic. And, and that's frankly one of those things, like I said, that you know pulls people out of their cars and, and incentivizes them to try alternative uh, uh, transportation. And uh, as I made in the comments before, the, the vote was extremely close for Proposition 2, to uh, 420 uh, with 13,277 votes for and 12,549 12, 12, against. And uh, they couldn't even call it for a few days. It was very close. Thank you. You know, my one of my thoughts, if um, if we're trying to encourage people to get out of their vehicles, then where we need to put our energy and make a greater investment is in transit. Um, you know, we've got challenges with our geography, our climate and our growth um, that make it really challenging for this for a big shift. Um, and how we do this with the CMP is through is through transit. That's how we're going to see, in my opinion, a very significant shift. Um, so Mountain Line is probably going to be going to voters, um, and, th and they're going to be going to voters perhaps this this coming election, and asking voters to support frequency and expansion of their system. Um, and this is this is also speaking to what um, Deb Harris said earlier. And so I would really like to see this energy that we have with our PAC, our BAC, our Sustainability Commission um, and Flag Biking Organization, F Cubed, and, and a lot of the people that we've, we've heard from this evening, let's put our energy into to moving that forward. Um, and I'm not trying to, to get away from, from Lone Tree, but, you know, it, the carbon neutrality plan is not a voter approved document and and we have something that we're looking at here tonight that is is and was was approved by voters and i i am fully in supportive and gravely concerned about climate change too and that's why i really want to see this focus on transit and it's coming from a policy level and this is a planning project that we need to move forward um, so that's my that's my call to action to everyone on the listening in is um, let's put our energy into transit as well. In addition to these policies moving forward, um, as we as we look at our local streets and our collector streets. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to ask um, Christine and Rick. Um, what are what are are there any other final questions that we need to answer or or do we do you feel that we have a list of of strong talking points for for going in front of council on the 25th uh, madam chair this is rick um due to technical difficulties christine cameron has joined me in my office here at city hall okay. and i'll let her take the first stab at that okay thank you uh, Thanks, Madam Chair and, and Commissioner, Commissioners and everyone tonight. Um, I believe we've got a lot of great information to, to take to Council, and I'm thankful that a, a lot of them were there with us tonight. Um, we will see uh, what changes we can make in between now and the 25th to address some of the issues like the safety. Um, you know, think about public involvement and what that means going forward. Um, you know, my concern with the public involvement is not that I don't want to provide that opportunity to the community, but um, it's difficult to to take something out and, and not be too restrictive um, with the art of the possible and ask people to re-envision things when 
you know, again, we're, we're working off of a concept that was already uh, taken through the public process and uh, and voted on and approved. And so I want to be sensitive to the fact that we need to get more engagement. Um, and so I, I, I will be thinking about that. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having maybe a little bit of a modified discussion with your input on, on the 25th to council. And, and again, we have that um, transformative transportation presentation sustainability does on the 18th. Yeah. And so this is a conversation that we will we will keep having. Um, and again, I think thanks everyone for your time tonight. Um, I would like to extend a, an opportunity from our council members who have, have joined us this evening. And I, even, I believe Mayor D was on the line for a little while too. Um, um, Council Member McCarthy, you know, in particular, I know that you've attended um, all of these transportation commission meetings, um, as well as um, at least all the ones, all the PAC and BAC meetings I've been on. Um, do you have any final remarks that you'd like to share with the groups here tonight? Thank you, Julie. Uh, yes, I have attended all of these. Um, and first of all, I want to just say thank you to everyone that's involved. I know that everyone involved uh, takes us very seriously and there may be some disagreement, but everybody wants the best for uh, Flagstaff. Uh, a couple of comments uh, to staff when this does come to council. I would like to see uh, the actual wording in the uh, proposition that went before the voters so that we can be consistent with that. Um, you know, I guess I am a little concerned that bicycles can't just go through the intersection. They have to go through almost like a pedestrian. I don't know if there's a solution to that. Um, I would be interested in some more information on uh, the safety analysis, especially for bicycles and pedestrians. I mean, if we have a car wreck, you know, you might have to buy a new car, but if you get hit by a car on a bicycle or as a pedestrian, we know how serious that can be. But um, anyway, I think those are my main takeaways. Uh, again, thank you everybody for taking this so seriously. Thank you, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Council Member McCarthy. Um, any other council members? to give you a chance to ask questions or make comment. This is Becky Daggett and. Um, oh, I didn't know Adam was still here. I would have raised my hand, Adam, if I would have known <laughs> that you uh -huh. were that you were still here. Um, I want to to echo what Council Member McCarthy said and just thank you all for this great um, discussion and you've all given me additional things to think about um, both the commission members and members of the public and I'm just really glad that I tuned in this evening to hear this um, really robust uh, discussion so thank you for all your work everyone thank you vice mayor Daggett um, council member Shimoni Thank you, Chair, um, Lead, and and thank you for your your leadership in today's meeting. This was this was a difficult conversation, and um, maybe didn't exactly go to the the way we might have wanted it to go with the with the you know presentation and the project being presented here. But I really appreciate your, your leadership in, in facilitating the conversation, and I really appreciate everybody who who commented and engaged in this discussion today. Uh, very important discussion, very helpful to me as a council member, and I'm extremely grateful for all of your insights and expertise and thoughts and concerns here. Um, I think, you know, I think that the, this is a large project. This is a very large project, and our values at the city are shifting. And so we're going through this growing phase where we're, 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 we're trying to get ahead of this so that we don't make mistakes like this moving forward. Because uh, I agree with a lot of the comments that we heard. It's too big. It's it's too big. Um, and, and so I'm hoping staff heard us pretty loud and clear today. And I know that they will on the 25th. But um, I think we have a lot more work to do on this. But I really just want to say thank you to all the commissioners, committee members, members of the public, staff, 
that were on this call tonight. Um, I think that there's been a lot of good work done here, but we just need to tweak some of the core um, ingredients in the project. And, and we'll get to that finish line, Julie, that you spoke about. You know, I, I, I want to get there with you and all of us. Um, but I think there's more work to do. But thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, have a good night, everybody. And uh, looking forward to future conversations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, commissioners, committee members, um, Jeff, Christine, Rick, uh, staff, tremendous, and, and WSP team, tremendous amount of work went into what you presented. So much detail um, that there, you know, people are going to need to take some time to digest it a little bit more. So, um, wonderful, wonderful job and appreciate the comments. I think with that, I would like to close out this um, and do a final call. Otherwise, I'm gonna close out this agenda item. Let's final call. Oh, Council Member Sweet, thank you. Um, Council Member Sweet put in the chat, she's traveling but was able to listen to um, a lot of the conversation and said thank you everyone for your thoughts and times. So thank you Council Member Sweet for that. Okay, with that, new business item, Lone Tree Overpass project update is closed. Old business, item three on the agenda, we have none. Concluding general business, um, we have reports from the Pedestrian Bicycle Advisory Committees, um, the links are provided in the agenda that commissioners can take a look at at their convenience. Um, there is a joint meeting with the PAC and BAC next week. Um, you should have received the inv invite and public notice for that um, for those of you interested in participating in that. Um, moving on to B, informational items two from commissioners and staff. and. Uh, I do not have any informational items. Um, commissioner, commissioners, any other informational items? Okay, hearing none from commissioners. Staff, do you have anything that um, you need to let transportation commissioners know of? Nothing additional from me. Okay. Thank you. All right. So our um, the link for the recordings, including this meeting, um, you have the link in the agenda. And I think you go to the Transportation Commission web page and um, get through that. If not, um, send Jeff an email about that. And our next meeting is scheduled for February 2nd. Uh, most of the items on that agenda are related to traffic calming and some of the work that we've been we've been doing and talking about. Um, I hope to see my fellow commissioners or um, would love to see you virtually, I guess at the council meeting on the 25th, as well as committee members. Um, thank you so much. And with that, um, I do you have some, one more thing, council member Shimoni? I see, okay, you're good. You're getting ready for your goodbyes. All right, so we're all turning on our cameras so that we can adjourn. Um, thank you all, be safe. And I'll see you soon. We're adjourned. Thanks, Madam Chair. Good night. Good night.